dive into the world of Python web scraping with this scrapey course for beginners. Learn to create scrapey spiders, crawl websites, clean and save data, avoid getting blocked, and deploy your scraper to the cloud, all while using Python scrapey. Joe Kearney developed this course. He is an expert in web scraping, and he's the co-founder of ScrapeOps. Hey everyone, welcome to the Free Code Camp Scrapey Beginners course. My name is Joe, I'm a co-founder at ScrapeOps, a platform that gives developers the tooling they need to monitor, schedule, and run their web scrapers. I'm also the co-founder of the Python Scrapey Playbook, a complete collection of guides and tutorials that teaches you everything you need to know to become a Scrapey developer. In this Free Code Camp Scrapey course, we're going to take you from complete Scrapey beginner to being able to build, deploy, and scale your own Scrapey spiders so you can scrape the data you need. You can find the code and written guides for this course over at the Python Scrapey Playbook Free Code Camp course page, so you can easily follow along with this video. The link will be in the description. We've broken this course down into 13 parts, which cover all the Scrapey basics. You need to go from never having used Scrapey before to being a competent Scrapey developer. If you want to dive deeper into any of these topics, then check out the Python Scrapey playbook itself or the ScrapeOps YouTube channel, which is linked in the description. Here you will find guides that dive deeper into the topics we've discussed in this course and cover some more advanced Scrapey topics too, such as scraping dynamic websites and scaling your web scrapers using Redis. So what is Scrapey? So I think the best little summary for that is directly on the scrapey.org website. So Scrapey is an open source and collaborative framework for extracting the data you need from websites in a fast, simple, yet extensible way. So it's an open source framework that anyone can use with Python and it makes scraping websites much, much easier. So it helps you do things like retrieve a page's HTML, parse, and then process the data, and then store that data in the file formats you want and in the location that you want. So that's what Scrapey is. So now the next question you probably have is, well, why should we choose Scrapey? What does Scrapey have to offer over anything else? So some of you might have already done a bit of scraping with Python, and you might have used things like just straight Python requests to request the page and then get the response and then you might have parsed that response using something like beautiful soup which helps you parse html so this is perfect if you're doing a just very simple scraping and you just want to scrape a couple of pages of a website or you just have something like a one-off site that you want to scrape by all means use something like python requests and beautiful soup if you're looking to do anything from small, medium to large scale, it's much better to use something like Scrapey because it comes with a load of features built in that you don't have to worry about. So it helps you do things such as data extraction from the HTML using CSS selectors. You can do automatic data formatting so it'll format the data you scraped into things like CSV, JSON, XML and many other formats. You can save the stuff directly into things like S3 buckets onto your local machine, and use middlewares to save the data into databases. So, so much of that is already taken care for you. So what else does it have that you don't have to worry about? Automatic retries, for example, if you look for a page and the page comes back with a, an error, it'll auto retry it for you and you don't even have to worry about all the logic that goes into things like auto retries. It, looks after concurrency so you can scrape from one page all the way up to thousands of pages at the exact same time using the same piece of code so with all this stuff so much is taken off your plate that you can just focus on doing what you want to do which is okay this is the data i want from the website and this is the format that i want to save it into and the other great thing the fact that Scrapey is an open sourced framework means that there's many thousands of developers all over the world who've made great plugins and extensions for it. Almost every single kind of question you might have is probably already answered. So it's very easy to find the questions and answers online and things like Stack Overflow for the use cases you'll be going through. And 
it makes it very easy if you don't find the question just to ask another one so I would really recommend Scrapey if you're looking to do anything that is more than just a very, very, very simple use case. So if you're looking to scrape any kind of website, Scrapey would be the place to start off your scraping journey. Okay, so this course will be delivered through video, of course, which you're watching right now. But along with the video, we have an accompanying article that goes with each section. So for example, part two, we have a full article here with all the commands you need to run, code snippets, and more in-depth explanations. So this makes things much easier if you're not someone who likes to watch video and you prefer to read things and take things step by step that way. We will also have all the code that we use. If you want to just jump into a part further down the line, you can go and you can download whatever part you need. We will have a, an accompanying Git repo where you can just download the code at that point in time and follow on. So hopefully that should make your learning that bit easier. Okay, so what we're gonna cover on this course. So we're in part one now. Part two will be setting up your virtual environment and setting up Scrapey on your computer. Part three, we look at how to create a Scrapey project. Part four, creating your first Scrapey spider and navigating through different pages getting the HTML from the page and then extracting what we need from the HTML. We look at crawling through multiple pages, then how to clean the data that you've just scraped using item pipelines in Scrapey. Then in part seven, we'll be looking at saving the data to files and databases and all the different ways we can do that. Part eight, looking at everything to do with headers and user agents and how we can use user agents and headers to bypass certain restrictions that websites might be putting on us when we try and collect the data. Part nine, we'll be looking at rotating proxies and proxy APIs and how they can help us bypass some of those issues about getting blocked. Part 10, we'll be looking at deploying and scheduling our spiders using ScrapeD. So when we want to run a spider on a regular basis, we want to have something set up that we don't have to worry about and kick off manually, but that will be programmatically run on a daily basis, hourly basis, every 10 minutes or whatever. So we look at everything to do with that in parts 10, 11, and 12. And we're looking at the different options that are out there in terms of the free options, open source options, paid options, the pros and cons of those options that we have and then that brings us to our recap at the end which is part 13 and part 13 we'll just go through everything we've learned and recap and talk about what there is left to do if you want to take your scraping to the next level so i think that's everything i wanted to talk about and we will see you in part two So in part two of this course, we're going to be looking at how to install Python, setting up your Python virtual environment on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and then finally, how to install Scrapey. Okay, so let's get started with that. So first things first, how to install Python. It's fairly easy. The first thing we want to do is we want to just go to python.org, go to the downloads section, and then you can click the download Python 3.11 or whatever version it will be when you're looking at it so obviously i'm doing it i'm on a mac so it automatically detects that and it automatically proposes that i download the version from mac os you guys if you're on windows you'd be wanting to download the latest version for windows so go ahead do that if you don't already have python we can quickly check if you do have python by going to your terminal or powershell so open that up and then I'm just going to open one up quickly here in Visual Studio Code. And what you just want to do then is just type in Python and dash dash version. And as I can see here, Python version 3.9 is installed for me. So I don't need to go and download it because I know it's already installed. So 
go ahead and check if you have Python installed. If you do have it installed, you can move on to the next section. And if you don't, just go ahead, download Python and install it. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is install pip if it's not already installed. So pip is just a package manager for Python, so we can download third party packages for our Python project. So what we do again, we just check is it installed. So it's just pip version again. And as I can see, I have pip version 22 installed here. So if you don't have it installed, we link to it in the documentation, in the article that we have for this, and in the video as well. So to install pip, you go to pip.pypa.io and go to installation, and they have supported methods for installing on Linux, Mac OS, and Windows. And they give you the commands you need to run once you have uh, Python installed to install pip. So it's very self-explanatory and very easy to do. All you need to do is copy this line and paste it into your terminal and hit enter. So if I do it here, it will just tell me that I already have it installed. So as you can see, it says requirement already satisfied, pip in, and then it gives the path. So we have pip installed, and the next part is we want to install a virtual environment. So vnv, which comes with Python 3, the latest version of Python, will already be installed if you have Python 3.3 and above. If you have a lower version of Python, you might need to install the vnv manually. And if you're on Windows, you may need to install it manually as well. So to do that, you just pip install virtual env if you're on Windows. And I'll do that right now. Pip install virtual env. And that will go ahead and install virtual env for you. If you're on Mac, you don't need to do this. Or if you're on Ubuntu, you more than likely won't need to do this either. So we have Python installed, we have pip installed, we have virtual env or vnv installed. So the next thing we can go ahead and do is actually create our virtual environment. So a virtual environment is just, think of it as a folder that sits on top of Python where you can add all these third party libraries and modules and they'll only be specific to the project you're currently running. Because what can happen is, if you've got multiple Python projects, you can also often have multiple of the same packages, but different versions to run your code. And you don't want, if you, for example, upgrade some third party package that it breaks one of your other projects because one of your other projects needed an older version of that third party package. So by using virtual environments, it just means that each project you have, the third party libraries you installed are specific to that project. So let's go ahead now and we'll just do Python minus M VNV and we're going to call the folder that we want VNV also. So I just want to make sure I'm in the correct um, folder. So I've just made a part two folder with nothing in it, as you can see. And I'm just going to do that now, minus m, vnv, vnv. So that's gone ahead and it's created this vn folder with these items in it here and it's installed correctly. If you're on Windows, you're just going to be using the virtual env command instead. Okay, so now that we have our virtual environment installed, uh, you can see it here, we want to just activate it so that any third party package we install after this will also be installed into this VN folder. So to do that, we just type in source and then VN bin activate. So then you can see it's activated because we have the folder name VN in brackets 
here. So that means anything we install from now on using the package installer pip will be installed into this folder and be specific only to this project. So we can go ahead now and install Scrapey. So we just do pip install Scrapey. And you can also get this command from the Scrapey website itself. As you can see, pip install Scrapey will install the latest version of Scrapey 2.7.1. So I'm just going to head and hit enter. And as you can see, it's downloading everything it needs for Scrapey to run. So depending on your connection and your computer, it can take a minute or two. Okay, so that's installed correctly, as far as I know. To check it's installed correctly, we can just run Scrapey and it should give us a list of commands. So if you see this output here, where it lists the available commands, you know that Scrapey is installed correctly. As you can see from this line here, Scrapey has detected that there's no Scrapey project created yet, so it just says no active project. So that's going to be the next step in part three is setting up our Scrapey project. So let's get going into part three. So in part three, we're going to be looking at how to create a Scrapey project using Scrapey. Then we're going to have an overview look at the project files that are generated when you create a new project. And then after that, we're going to go into detail on all the different parts of a Scrapey project. So that entails Scrapey spiders, items, item pipelines, Scrapey middlewares and settings. So part three is really going to be a kind of a theory heavy part of this course. So if you already know a bit of Python, this is probably going to be a lot more interesting than if you don't. So you can feel free to dip around and, and have a look at what parts of this would be most interesting to you. We also have an article that goes along with this that might be a bit easier to digest. So let's get going and create our project. So to do that, I've got a folder here, part three. And inside that folder, I've got just the full project we're going to go through in a second and I've got my virtual environment that I've already activated. So you guys, if you've followed on from part two, should have already activated your virtual environment and you should already have Scrapey installed. So if you don't have that done, just hop back to part two and make sure Scrapey is installed and your virtual environment is activated. Okay, so now we can go ahead and use the scrapey start project command to create our new project. So it's just simply scrapey space start project space and then the name of your project. We're going to call this one book scraper because we're going to be scraping a site with books in it. So if I hit enter, it's gone ahead and created a new folder here, book scraper, you can see. And if I do an LS, you can see Book Scraper is there as well. And if we go into Book Scraper itself, we can see we have Book Scraper and Scrapey.cfg. So I'm just going to open up the folder here, and we can see inside of that we have several different files and folders. So first off, we have our Spiders folder that at the moment has no spiders in it, but we'll be doing that in part four. We'll be generating spiders that go in there. Then we have items, middlewares, pipelines, and settings. So your basic Scrapey project will contain these parts. Now, you don't have to use items. You don't have to create middlewares. You don't have to touch pipelines, but you will always have a spider. So. You can think of items, middlewares, and pipelines are optional, but we will be using them because if you're scraping anything more than just one page, it becomes a lot easier just to use 
the pipelines items and middlewares and instead of trying to have everything custom made in a spider. Okay, so the next thing we're going to quickly look at is a fully fleshed out spider. So just to give you an idea of what would go into these things, like what is in items, what does middlewares mean, what do we put in pipelines, we're just going to go through some code and give you an example. So don't be too scared if you don't understand any of this stuff right now. We're going to be going through all of it in parts 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we start off with our spider. So in here, in our spiders folder, there's just a simple spider called book spider. It's just a simple class. It's got a name. It's got some functions there. And inside it has things like items, which link into our items.py file here. As we can see, we're importing it. And this is just a basic spider. So I'll just give you a quick overview of what it does. Once you run the spider, it goes to start requests and it puts this uh, URL into this URL variable and then it returns scrapey that request function with the URL. And once the request comes back from the page with the HTML in it, it goes to the next function, which is defined in the parse function. So this parse function then lets us use the response that contains the HTML and we can then manipulate this HTML and extract the things that we want, such as the title, category, description, price. Once we've got those, those pieces of data are put into our book item and that is then returned to us in the console or if you've got other things set up such as feeds into a file. So that might all be completely overwhelming for you, but don't worry, we're going to be going through all of this in extreme detail and showing you exactly how to do everything that is already here. This is just to give you an idea of what's what. Okay, so you might have seen this book item that I mentioned. So book items then links into our items.py file and in that file we just describe how we want the item to be set up. So we want our book should contain a title, category, description and price. So then using this, we can then use this book item both in our spiders when we fill the book item with the different pieces of data and return it and also in our pipelines. So in our pipelines, we have a simple test one set up here, which goes through mimicking how you would then get the data that is returned um, in the book spider, this book item with all the details, and it goes through how it would save the item in a database. So think of it, we extract the data, the next step would be to put the data into the item and then to put the item into a database. So pipelines are what happens once you've extracted and you're yielding, returning the data from your spider. So here we have, for example, process item. It's fairly self-explanatory. It takes the item with the title, the category, description, and it inserts it into our books database table. So that's what gets put into items and item pipelines. Again, this could be all very confusing for you. If you know a bit of Python, hopefully it shouldn't be too confusing, but we'll be going into it in a lot more detail later on. Okay, so then we have our middlewares. So middlewares are where you can get into the nitty gritty of how you want the spider to operate. So it gives you control over lots of different things such as timing out requests, how long you want the request to go on for, 
what headers you want to send when you make a request, what user agents should be used when you make a request. If you want to do things like multiple retries, you can mess around with that in the middlewares section. And as you can see, it comes with several kind of defaults that are there that you can either update to what you want or you can create your own ones that go in here too. So you also have managing cookies, caches, there's everything like that would be dealt with in your middlewares. Now, there's two types of middlewares. There is downloader middlewares and spider middlewares. Most of what we'd be doing would probably go into the downloader middlewares, but spider middlewares can also do things such as adding or removing requests or items, handling different um, exceptions that crop up. If there's an error with your spider, handling things like that. So all these middlewares go in the middlewares.py file. And then last of all, we have our settings. So settings is fairly self-explanatory. It's where you put all your settings. So you've got basic things like, do we obey our a robots.txt file when initial request is made to a website? Do we check that first? And if it says, don't scrape this site, do we obey that? Yes or no, it's set here. The number of concurrent requests we make. So if we're scraping a website, do we send one request at a time or do we send 10 or 100 requests at a time? That's also set here. So everything to do with how your spider and crawling operates will be either enabled or disabled in this settings.py file. Now we also have, going back to what we were talking about, our middlewares, we have our spider middlewares, as you can see here, and our downloader middlewares, as you can see here. So this is where you can, if you create a new middleware, so this one directly links to the book scraper spider middleware that is right here. So you need to make sure if you create a new middleware that you then enable it in settings also. And also for item pipelines, that's also where you need to enable, uh, if you create a new item pipeline, that it is enabled in here also. Okay, so I think we've gone through the basics of a full Scrapey project and what's contained in there. We've gone through what's usually in a spider, gone through items and item pipelines, how they can process the data once we've scraped the data from a page. And then we've looked at middlewares and how in settings we can turn everything on or off. So I think that's everything we want to cover in this part. Now, again, don't be too overwhelmed by this. It does get a lot easier, trust me. So stick with it. And in part four, we'll be creating our first spider and extracting some data from a web page. In part four of our Scrapey Beginners course, we're going to look at how to create a Scrapey spider using the Scrapey shell to find the CSS selectors we need, using those CSS selectors in our spider to extract the data we want from the page, and then finally, we're going to get our spider to go through multiple pages and extract data from multiple pages. So let's get going. So I've got my terminal open here. I've already activated my virtual environment. I'm continuing on from part three. So if you're just joining us here, make sure you already have everything set up as we have done in part three. I want to go all the way down into my spiders folder. So at the moment it's empty. It's just got an init.py file in it. So we want to go down the level and down into spiders. So now I'm in my spiders folder and I can see there's just an init.py there. So in this spiders folder, I'm going to run this command, scrapey gen spider the name of my spider, which I'm going to call book spider, and then the URL of the website that we're going to be scraping. And in this case, it's going to be the books.toscrape.com site, which is 
a site that is there for people to practice their scraping on. So if you go ahead and go down to your spiders folder and type this command into your terminal and hit enter, Scrapey will then create this spider, as you can see here, created spider book spider using template basic in module, and then it gives this. So if we check that out now, we can see that bookspider.py is there. And if I open this up in my VS code, we can see a created book spider here. So this is just a very, very basic uh, spider. We'll be adding a lot more to this but we'll just go through a few bits of what were generated here. So obviously the name of our spider is book spider. So when we do scrapey crawl to actually kick the spider off using scrapey, we'll be doing scrapey crawl book spider. The allowed domains list is books.toscrape.com. This is important because Later on, when we're going to be doing crawling, our spider is going to be going through multiple different links and having this allowed domains here listing only the domain we want to scrape prevents our spider from <clears throat> going off and scraping hundreds of different websites across the internet. Because as you can imagine, URLs link from one page to another and sometimes a website might link to an outside website. And in this case, you would not want your spider to start crawling and scraping the entire internet. So that's why we have allowed domains here. Next, we have start URLs. So this is usually just the first URL that the spider starts scraping, but you can actually have multiple URLs here as well for it to go through one after the other. Then we have our parse function. Our parse function is the function that gets called once the response comes back. So we'll be filling this parse function with all the different pieces we want to extract the data from the page itself. Okay, so we've gone through the basics of this generated spider. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the scrapey shell to find the CSS selectors we want to get the data from the page. So what I mean by CSS selectors, for those of you who aren't familiar. So first of all, <clears throat> if you just open your developer tools, you can do this by right clicking in Chrome or Safari or Firefox, and it's usually inspect or sometimes it's called developer tools. So you do that and this comes up here. If you go to the elements tab, you'll see then all the makeup of the page in HTML and CSS. So here, for example, we've got a H3 tag and an A tag for links. And this is the link to the page uh, of this book here. So we'll be looking now at how we can actually pick out these tags so that Scrapey knows which pieces of data we want to extract from the page itself. OK, so let's just go back to our terminal and just to make using the scrapey shell a little bit easier. We're going to do just a pip install and then ipython, which just is a different shell. It would help if I spelled it correctly. This is just a different shell, which is a bit easier to read. So I just did pip install ipython. And then to activate this, we want to go to settings and we I oh know we want to go to sorry not settings this scrapey.cfg and we're going to add the shell as a separate line here so now that that's done I can close that and we can run scrapey shell so scrapey shell then gives us this so what we want to do now that we have Scrapey Shell open is, as you can see, we've got a list of the commands that it gives us that are available. So we can do useful shortcuts fetch, which is the command that we're going to be using. So this fetches a URL and updates the local objects. So we'll just run this fetch command now. 
and I'll show you exactly what I mean. So we want to fetch this books to scrape.com. So I'm just going to paste in this URL here and it's going to go off. It's going to fetch this and it's going to put the resulting HTML, everything in here that we see into a variable inside in the scrapey shell so we can access it and run different commands on it. So it enables us to kind of practice the code we want uh, to then put into our spider. So what we want to do is it, it put everything in from the page into this response variable. So now we can just do response.css and let's say we're going to look for something specific on the page. So what we can do is move our mouse over these different tags on the page. We can see article contains one book on the page. So we can just say, okay, give me article and we'll just have the class name in as well. So any class name needs to have just dot in front of it when we're referring to it like this. So that has given us all the different books that are on the page. Now, let's say we want to just get the first book. We can just do this with a get and it's given us just the HTML that is for that first book. If we want to then put all the books into a different variable so we can run some other commands on them within the scrapey shell, we can do something like books is equal to response.css article dot product pod. If we do that, it's after putting all the different books into this books variable. So then if we run len on books, len in Python gets us the length. So it gives us that there's 20 books. If we go back to our page, we can indeed see there is 20 books. So there's four in each row. There's one, two, three, four, five rows showing one of 20. So that's correct. Okay, so for the purposes of this part four, we're going to extract the name of the book, the price of the book, and the URL. So we can actually go in and get further details later. So the name, the price, and the URL. So now that we've got our books, what we can do is we can put the first book of the list of books. So we'll make a new variable called book and we'll say that that's equal to or equal to books and the first item in the list of books that we have. So now if I do book.css and then I go back and okay we want to get the the uh, title of the book here. So I can see from this that we've got a H3 tag and we've got an A tag. And I want the text that is within this A tag here. So I'm going to do H3 and A, and that should get me the text that I'm looking for, the title of the book. So go back here and I do H3 A, and then we just need a little bit extra, which is just this text. And I do get, that gives me exactly what I was looking for, which is a light in the dot, dot, dot. This corresponds exactly to this. So I've got the title of my book. Next, I want to get the price of my book. So I'm going to just remove these two pieces here and I'm going to inspect the price. Okay, so if we look at dot product price and then dot price underscore color should give us the price. So let's do that now. So that's dot product price dot price color. Let's try and run that. Okay, it didn't 
exactly what oh yeah i know because I, I did an extra double dot there you go so that got us exactly the price we we're looking for and finally we want to get the url so the url is interesting because it's also part of this h3a tag but we want instead of the text within it we want this href attribute here which contains the part of the link to more information on the actual book itself so if we open this up in a new tab we'll see the full page that we're looking for and here you can see we've got the full product description and lots more details there Okay, so we still want to do H3 and A, but instead of text, we're going to say a attrib href. That gives us our href attribute that was contained in this A tag that we were looking at a second ago. So using the scrapey shell we've managed to see how we can use the css selectors to extract the title the price and the url for one book so now that we know that we can add these into our parse function and we can also loop through all that list of books and get all the details for the 20 books that are on the page okay so let's start adding things to our parse function so first i'm just going to add in what we initially had to get all the books that were there and that is books equals to response.css article and then product underscore pod so we had that up here so i'm just taking this line here that we used in our scrapey shell and I'm putting it in to our parse function. Okay, the next thing we wanna do is we're just going to loop through it. So we just want four book in books, and then we are going to type yield. So yield is like return. And then what we want scrapey to return to us is going to be the name the price and the url so we'll start with the name and then we're going to go up to where we got our text and we're going to use this exact piece here and then we're going to get our price and we're going to go to where we got our price and then last of all our url and for that we have our href attribute okay now that we have that we should be able to go ahead and run our spider and see what happens so first let's exit our scrapey shell by typing exit and then we might need to go up a level to our book scraper folder and we should be able to run scrapey crawl book spider which is the name of our spider so if that goes according to plan we should see item scrape count of 20 they're the 20 books on the page and you can see what was returned here the name there is a book name a price there is a price and url there's the url and if we just scroll up we can see that the 20 books that were on the page all the data was scraped and output to our terminal so that worked exactly how we wanted it to work now as you've seen we have multiple pages there's not just this one page of 20 books there's actually a lot more than that so we're going to look at how we can go to the next page if there is one and then scrape all the books on the next page and then keep looping through all the pages of books until there are no more pages of books to scrape. So as you can see here, we have a next page at the bottom of every 
page of books. So if we click the next page button, it goes to catalog page 2.html. And then we have a new page of 20 different books. And as you can see, it's going through all the different pages, page three, and there's a previous there as well to go back a page. So we're going to want Scrapey to bring us to page dash three or page dash four dot HTML if there is another one to scrape. So we're going to go back and we're going to do Scrapey shell again. To open our shell, we're going to again run our fetch command to fetch our website URL. And then we are going to try and get the link. So to do that, we're going to inspect the next button. And as we can see here, it's in an li tag, and then it's got a class name of next. And then within that, we want the link, which is contained in this href attribute. And that's contained in an a tag for links. So let's see if we can get that now using our scrapey shell. So we do response.css and then we have li.next. So li for the li tag, dot next for the class name, and then a, and then we want the href attribute. So, so let's see, can we do that? And that gives us exactly our catalog forward slash page two HTML, which corresponds to, well, this was not the exact one we we're looking at. We we're looking at page one. So I can just remove that and go down here. And this one should have catalog forward slash page two HTML. And that corresponds to this. So now that we know how we can get the next page, we can just put in under our loop. We're just going to paste what we had here to get our link. And we're just going to do next page is equal to, and this is going to contain our next page link. So, the next thing we need to check for is if we get to the last page, there's going to be no more next page link. So that's how we can know when we've reached the end. So we can check that by going to page 50. So if I type in page 50 and go to the bottom, I should see that there is no more next button. There's a previous button, but there's no next button. So I've reached the end. So that's what our test is going to be. We're going to put in an if statement and we're going to say, if the next page URL is not none, then we know there's another page. So we can continue going until there is no more pages left to scrape. So let's add that in now. Okay, we're just going to do if next page is not none, and then next page URL is equal to, and here we're going to create the full URL because next page doesn't contain the full URL, it's only a relative URL. So we need to get this part of the URL plus the catalog forward slash whatever the next part of the page is. So let's add that in, save that, and then the important part is we need to do yield response dot follow next page URL and then callback. Uh, is equal to self dot parse. Okay, 
so what this does is it obviously creates our next page URL and then we tell Scrapey to go to this next page URL using response.follow and the callback is the function that's going to get executed once the response comes back from the URL that we've gone to. So once we get the response from that URL, it's going to kick off self.parse and self.parse is this function again. So it's going to keep going through and keep going through and keep going through and calling itself until there is no more pages. And then in that case, it's going to stop. Let's try and run that now. So let's exit out of our scrapey shell and let's just do a scrapey crawl again. Scrapey crawl and book spider and see what we get. Okay, so we have an item scrape count of 40. So it scraped four pages, but obviously four pages is not 50 pages. So there's a bit of a bug here, which we're going to have to get to the bottom of. Let's start looking at the next page URL, because that's obviously where it's going wrong. If it's only finding four pages, there must be an issue with the URL here. So if we go back and we again inspect the element. So here we can see it's page-50.html. And I think we had and here it's 49. But then if we were on the initial page and we check here, it's got catalog forward slash page two. So sometimes it's got just page dash two and sometimes it's got the catalog in the href. So that's obviously why it only scraped four pages. So the fifth page only has page dash five. So we're going to have to just modify our next page um, if statement here just to check that we have catalog in the href. If we do, then we do a slightly different next page URL than if we don't. So let's just add that in now. So if the catalog forward slash is in next page, then the next page URL is going to just be what we currently have. Um, but if it's not, we want an else. And we're going to say, add in the next page URL. But we're going to add in catalog here. So this should ensure that the next page URL is correct. So if it contains catalog, we don't need to have catalog in this part. If it doesn't contain catalog, we do have to have it. And then that should make the correct URL. So hopefully that's fixed that bug. So let's try run the scrapey crawl one more time. Okay, so this seems to be going through a lot more pages, which is a good sign. Uh, let's give it another minute or two to finish up and we can see the total item count at the end and the total pages scraped. So this is kind of the process that you have to do when you are creating a spider to scrape data. There'll be small bugs like this that pop up and you need to do a small bit of detective work to find out why your spider is failing at certain parts or not able to extract certain piece of data from the page. So we can see here we have response received count of 51, item scrape count of a thousand. So if we go back, there's a thousand results. So it scraped all the books that we were looking for. That's pretty much everything we wanted to cover in this part four. In part five, we're going to go through and each book we're going to click into the book and then we're going to extract more product data from the product page itself so right now we're just kind of doing the easy thing of just going through one page one page one page just the main and extracting just the name the url and the price but 
in real life scenarios, most of the time we want to get a lot more data and that involves doing things like going in, clicking into the actual product we're looking at and actually getting more in-depth uh, data. So we'll be looking at how we can do that in part five. So in part five, we're gonna look at how to crawl pages using the Scrapey Spider, using CSS selectors and expats to extract more complicated pieces of data from pages, such as from tables, from breadcrumbs, things like that. And then we're going to move on to saving the data into certain file formats, such as CSV or JSON format. So let's get started. We're continuing on from part four. So if you need to get the code for that, we'll have that available for, to, for you to download and follow on at this point. Or if you've got your part four already completed, you can just continue on from there. So in part four, we just ran uh, our spider and it went through and got us the details of the thousand books that are on the books to scrape.com site. So the next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be, instead of just scraping the URL, the price and the name of the book, we're actually going to be going into the book page itself and we're going to be taking things such as the rating, the product description, the product type, the price excluding VAT, including VAT, the category that it's in, such as poetry in this case. So we're going to be looping through all the different books, looping through every single page and getting all the specific data for each book that is on this site. Okay, so let's go back to our spider code. And the first thing we're gonna look at doing is we want to start going into each page individually. And so to do that, we're going to do something that's very similar to going to each next page URL. So we'll copy this code from the bottom and we're going to do this for every book in the list of books. So instead of just yielding the data, we're going to be going into the URL. So we're just gonna paste that in over our yield right here. We're gonna remove the next page none section we're going to move our next page URL up here and we're going to have to just modify where we get the URL for the each individual book. So if we just go back into inspect the elements again and check out, okay, so that was H3 and A and we want the href for that h3a tag. So we just want h3a attribute href. That should get us the next page. And then it should create the correct URL for us. <clears throat> Instead, let's call of next page because it's not the next page, it's the relative URL of the book. Let's just call it relative URL. And let's just put this here and the next thing we want to do is we want the callback function instead of being parse we're going to do parse book page. So we're going to make a new function to parse the book page individually one by one. So let's go down here. Let's do def parse book page self and response. And the moment let's just put pass in there. So that is going to loop through instead of next page URL. <clears throat> We're going to call this one book URL and okay so the only other thing to change that is incorrect is that obviously 
we need to loop through the list of books. So this book needs to be used and we're going to get the book.css and that's where we're going to get our link from with the this link here. So that goes to relative URL um, variable. Then we make the correct book URL and then using this book URL, we yield. Um, so we basically go into this um, book URL and then the response HTML that comes back from this URL will get parsed by the parse underscore book underscore page function, which is the one we made down here. OK, so I think we can save that for now. And next thing we want to do is start fleshing out our parse book page. So what we're going to do first is we're going to open up our scrapey shell again, like we did in part four. And we're going to look at the different CSS selectors and expat selectors for the different items that we want to scrape on the book page itself. So let's click into one of the books and we're going to see what we want to extract from this page. Let's go back, open up our scrapey shell in our terminal again. So just scrapey shell. And when that opens, we're just going to use our fetch function again to fetch the full URL from one of the book pages, which in this case is just the very first book I've picked in the list. So I can just put in the URL in here hit enter. That's going to go off, get the HTML of that page and stick it in the response variable. So just like we did in part four, we can see what works and what doesn't work with our CSS selectors. So let's just do response.css and then let's inspect the page again and just, okay, so we have product description there is an ID and there is a P tag underneath that. So product pay underscore page there. So that gives us the whole page. So let's just try and see what happens if we do product underscore page. That seems to give us back the whole page. Now let's look at getting the title of the book for example. So in this case, on this page, it's in the product underscore main and it's H1. So let's go ahead and just do so dot product underscore main H1 text. And there we have a light in the attic which matches to our title here. So that's very simple, just as we've done before. So now let's do something a little more complex. Let's get the category up here. So we have poetry in this case. So for things that are a little bit more complicated like this, sometimes it can be easier just to use expats instead of CSS selectors. So expats are very similar, but instead of using class names directly, the format of how we write the expats is just a little different to how we would use CSS selectors. So I've got one pre-written out, which I'll just paste in here. So paste in my expat, and that gives me poetry. So I'll just explain to you how this got poetry. So it went to the UL HTML tag. It put in the class breadcrumb. So if we go back to the top here, we should see it's in a UL HTML tag and the class is breadcrumb. And then we have several LI tags and then we have an A tag within the LI tag and we have the href. So here we can see that's where the LI tag comes into it. And then the active class is on the grayed out section here. So it's then going from, it's going to here, and then it's saying preceding sibling. 
So get me the preceding li tag before the one that has the active equals class on it. So it's going to here and then it's going back one to the preceding sibling and it's getting the text within here. And it's doing that with the text at the end here. So as you can see, preceding sibling, li, one, and then a, and text at the end. So expats are quite similar to CSS selectors. In not every case will you have a class name or an ID tag on a HTML tag. So in the case of the product description, which I showed you a second ago, we'll just look at it again. There is no class name or no CSS ID on, on this P for paragraph tag here. So in that case as well, we can say, right, go to the product description using the expats and then get me the following sibling that's a P tag. So I can just show you that one. So it's go to the product description ID, get me the following sibling with the P tag, and then within that, get me the text. So that's how expats work for getting some of these corner cases where you might not have a simple class name or a simple ID on the HTML tag. Okay, so we know how we can get the product description and the category tag up here. We know how we can get the price and the title. Next, let's look at extracting data from tables. So if we inspect element again, we can see that this is all contained within a table and this table has several rows which have tr as the HTML tag and then within the table row we have th and td and that goes the whole way down so each row has one more th and td so what we can do is we can specify okay get me all the rows in this table and then we can say okay we know that the product type is always going to be the second row so let's always look for the text that is within the td of the second row if we wanted for example to see the product type so first we want to get all the table rows so we're going to look at table and then all the trs that are in that table so then let's assign that to table underscore rows in our scrapey shell so if you just do table underscore rows equals to response dot css and then have table space tr within the brackets that will make sure that all those table rows are within table rows we can quickly check the length of that that gives us seven rows and there's one two three four five six seven rows so now we can do something as simple as table underscore rows. Let's look at what we said a second ago. The second one, the dot CSS again, and we want the TD, and we wanted the text within that. And I guess again we use get and we get books. So again, the numbering starts at zero, and then the second one is second line is number one and then we look at the td here the td and that gets us books so that's how this line corresponds to here in this table so knowing that we can then go ahead and get things like the price excluding tax we can just put in something very simpler the next row down and that should give us the price excluding tax. So we now can get all the data we need from this table. And the only last thing to look at is looking at how we can get the stars. So if we just look at, again, inspect element, we can see we have several stars here. It has icon star, icon star, and star rating of three. So 
that's where we can see the number of stars. It's within this class that they've written three. So we need to do something slightly different for this. So first off, we're going to get the star rating. So we're going to do response.css, then p star rating for the class. And then we're going to ask for the attribute of class. So this is the attribute, the attribute name is class, and then it should give us our three that we're looking for. So let's just do that now. So response.css, p star rating, attribute class, and that gives us star rating of three. So using our scrappy shell, we've looked at how we can get all the different pieces of data from the page. So let's start filling that into our parse book page function here. So we can actually get all the book data to be scraped correctly. Okay, so let's just exit out of our scrapey shell. And let's first just get the table rows. So table rows are going to be equal to response.css and then we're going to have what we had up here where you can see table rows is table tr. So table tr is a table rows and we can work with that now to fill in the rest of the details. So we want to remove pass and then we're just going to do yield and we're going to have our details inside here. So let's start off with the URL. That's easy because we can just use the response, response to URL. So the URL of the page is contained within this response object. Then let's get the title. So we had that up here, here. So we can just copy this directly. Let's don't forget to add the commas at the end. And let's get the product type, the price excluding tax, including tax, the tax. So these are all to do with the table. So we're going to be doing table row one for the second row and then TD text get for the product type and so on for the price excluding tax and including tax. As you can see, price excluding tax, price including tax, they're all one after the other here. So all we're doing is incrementing the number here and the tax itself and we might as well add in the availability and the number of reviews as well since that's just a continuation of the same thing so let's add those two in we'll add in the stars by doing this so let's copy what we have down here and we'll just call that uh, stars and we can just paste that directly and let's also get the category and the description like we had a second ago so category and with that using the expats so that was this guy here let's just paste that we might have to just get it all in the same line Perfect, and let's get the description. Okay, and we just want this XPath that we were using earlier in our scrapey shell as well. Again, just making sure that we have it all in the same line and that we add in our commas. Finally, the only thing missing is the price. And we can do that by getting the 
simple response. And then .css p dot price color and then the text from that. So the price is up here. And that's the class of price color within the p tag. So if we save all that, that should be everything we need to parse the individual book pages. And the thing that's just missing here is the next page, which we just need to add back in. We deleted that earlier by mistake. So that's how we get the next page URL. Okay, so everything else looks correct. So just a quick recap. The spider is gonna kick off, go to this start URL. The response that comes back the first time around will go into this parse function. This parse function, then we get all the books on the main page. So that is starting with all these different books here. Then the next thing that happens is we get the relative URL and we turn that into the book URL. We do that by getting each of these URLs here. Once we get the first book's URL, we then go into that book page. So what happens is the code basically goes in here. It then goes to the callback function, which is parse book page down here. It goes, gets all these details here that we specified, and then it loops to the next book on the page because this so it, it comes back out of here and then loops back up to the start and goes to the second book on the page goes clicks in gets the data comes back does the third book on the page so it loops through all the books on the pages keeps getting all the data for each book and then it goes to the next page and then once all the pages are done it finishes so if we've done everything correctly, we should be able to now run our spider and see does that work. So let's try and do a scrapey crawl. The thing we're gonna do that's slightly different this time is we're going to have the output go to a file. So instead of having the output come into just our terminal, we're going to also get it to save to a file. So we do this by doing minus O uh, or dash O and then we're just going to call it book data and we'll do to um, CSV. CSV. So CSV file formats can be opened in Excel or can be put into, you know, Google Sheets and different applications like that. So it's CSV just stands for comma separated values. So if we run that, hopefully there's no issues. And as you can see, there's book data that CSV here. We can open that and we can see we have loads of data. So all the stuff that we were looking for, price, description, everything else seems to be there. So I'm just gonna stop that now before it gets to the end because that seemed like it's working correctly. It was already on page 15 here, as you can see. Okay, and I'll run that one more time, except this time we we'll do it in instead of bookdata.csv, we're going to get it to output to JSON. So I'm just going to delete that one and get it to output to JSON format instead. JSON format can just be a bit easier to read. And if you're doing further coding, it can be easier to parse as well. So if we open it up, as you can see, it has all the data nicely formatted, the title, price including tax, availability, the number of reviews, all the data is all there. So that's working nicely. Obviously it's gonna take a minute or two to scrape all thousand books. But I think that's everything we wanted to go through in part five. In part six, we're just going to be looking at how we can use items and item pipelines to better structure and clean our data before we start saving it into things like a database. 
So it'll just put a bit more structure on our code and it'll enable us to do things such as, for example, we could change the prices from pounds to dollars before it gets saved. We could, you know, remove any trailing white space. Lots of different examples we'll go through in part six of how to clean up the data. Okay, see you in part six, guys. So in part six of the Scrapey Beginners course, we're going to be looking at Scrapey items and Scrapey pipelines. So first off, we're going to go through what Scrapey items are. Then we're going to use Scrapey items to structure our existing spider a bit better. Then we're going to go into what Scrapey pipelines are and what they do. And then we're going to use the Scrapey pipelines to clean our data. So let's get started. If you're continuing on from part five, you should have everything already set up. If not, you can download the code from our repo and continue on from where we are now. So I'm presuming you already have your book scraper project set up with your spider set up and you've got your environment activated and you have Scrapey installed and Python installed and everything else is running. Okay, so items. So when you generate a Scrapey project, it generates this items.py file. And this is where you put your items. So items just help us define what we want in a block of data that we're scraping and that we're returning. So for example, here you can see in our book spider, we have no specific item declared. We're not using an item that's been created in our items.py, but instead we just have a yield with all the different pieces of data we're extracting from the page. So that works fine, but just to clean things up and to make things a bit less ambiguous, the best thing to do is to use the items.py and declare a specific item in there. So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the one I've already got in called book item. The book scraper item is just the default one. You can leave that there for the moment. So book item just has everything that we already have used in our book spider. So URL, title, product type, all these different things. But instead we're declaring them specifically here. So you might say, well, what's the point of that? Well, one example is that if I do a mistype and reviews goes in like this, this might then not go into my database or might not go and be processed further down the line. And I might not even notice it. But if I'm using an item, Scraper will throw an error and say, this num underscore reviews with two R's does not exist. And it'll alert you to the fact that there's a typo here. So that's one very good reason as to why we would use our items and actually define the item first. So now that we've got the item defined, we've got our item class created, let's actually start using that. So first off, we want to import that into our spider. So we go up to the top and we're importing book item. As you can see, it brings us directly to the book item. Now, the next thing we want to do is we just want to specify book underscore item is equal to book item. And then we're just going to yield book item at the bottom. So instead of yielding just that dictionary there, we're going to yield book item. And then we're going to remove those two brackets and we're going to say book item URL is equal to response to URL and so on all the way down. So change all these into using our item. And then once that's done, we'll start looking at item pipelines. 
So let's look at the data that had been saved into our file. So this book data dot json was what we did in part five. That was the output from our spider that ran. So as you can see, we had things like the URL, the title, so on and so forth. But if you'd noticed, we have the price excluding tax, for example, has this encoded value here. So it looks like the pound sign did not go in correctly. So you can specify a specific serializer that you want to use on a specific field. So for example, if it was like the price, I have a serialized price function I can write and I can then use that serialize price to stick a dollar or a pound sign in front of the value. So for example, I can stick serialize price and I'll put it in front of the price excluding tax. So I could just do something like serializer serializer is equal to and then serialize price so that would make the value go in here and then have the pound side applied to it before it gets put into price excluding tax so that's also a cool way that you can use items with serializers so i'm just going to remove that one for now because we actually end up processing the data from this in item pipelines in a second anyway. I just wanted to show you how you could use it if you didn't want to do pipelines and you are you were only going to scrape a small bit of data and you didn't want to do a lot of post-processing, there's no point using pipelines and you could just stick to using just items and have a serializer if you needed to. But if you're going to do anything more complex and you want to do a lot more processing of your data, you're better off using pipelines instead of just using serializers. The next thing we want to do is look at our pipelines. So in our pipelines, again, Scrapey defines a book scraper pipeline when you create the project. This is just here to give you an idea of what you can get started with. So using pipelines, you can clean your data. For example, you can remove the currency signs if you want. You could convert the price from pounds to dollars. You can format strings to integers. If you're going to save it into a database, that becomes very important. You can do things like converting your relative URLs to full URLs. You can validate your data, check if the price is actually a price or is it sold out. And then in that case, you can, you know, put in a price of zero. And you can also use the pipelines to store the data. So instead of having all the data going into a file like we've done in part five, we could have it, we could use a pipeline to get the data to go directly into a database, which we will be doing in future parts of this series. So let's clean up our data a bit now. What do we need to clean? Well straight away this is not good for our data this encoded value here so we need to sort that out another thing we need to sort out could be the availability of the stock so you might say okay in stock 19 available is fine but if i needed to run a piece of code later on this data that's not very useful because i just want to know that there's 19 books i don't want to have this extra text here and here and brackets. So if I just wanted availability to be 19, I could use the pipeline to remove the in stock and the available parts of the string and just convert that 19 into an integer. Okay, so we'll do that also. And I think I saw in some places that things like the title had a trailing white space or the descriptions had trailing white space. So that's also something that we could remove. And another thing would be changing the category. We could change the category. Instead of it being thriller with a capital, we could change that to thriller with lowercase. 
So this kind of standardization of data before it gets saved into a file or into a database is important, especially when you start scraping at scale and doing larger projects. So we're just going to go through a bunch of different processing in our process item in our pipeline. So we will just add everything in here and then the item will be returned. So let's start with just removing the white space. So I'll just paste in the code I've already got and talk you through it. Okay, we straight away get our item, which gets passed in to our process underscore item. So we've got the item available. We pass it into the item adapter. So as you can see up here, useful for handling different item types with a single interface. With this adapter, we can get all the field names and then we can loop through using our for loop loop through all the field names and if it's not the description we want to use the strip function to strip the white space from the strings so we're just getting the field name and then stripping the value and putting that back into what was initially there for that value Okay, now let's quickly look at converting the product types uppercase to lowercase. If there is an uppercase value for the, for example, thriller or poetry values, we can specify specific keys that we're looking for in this. As I mentioned, we'd look at category. You can also do things like product type. And we're going to just do the same thing except we're doing the lower function on the value. Now let's look at cleaning the price data as I mentioned earlier and as part of that make sure that the price data is saved as a float which can be important and all the prices aren't always going to be rounded up to the nearest dollar or pound or euro for that kind of data. So here we loop through the different price keys, which because we're saving several different pieces of data, we've got price, price excluding tax, price including tax, and the tax. And for each one of these, we're replacing the pound sign with nothing. And we can also do something like replacing the, for example, Unicode with a specific value. The other one I wanted to do was to change the availability to remove the extra text that was in there. So we'll quickly add that in. To do that, we're just doing the split function on the bracket. If it sees that there's, bracket, there's no bracket there, then we'll just set the availability to zero. If there is a bracket there, then we will split the second piece of the array that is returned from this function and we will say okay the second piece of it we'll split that again using the split function and we then know that the first item in this availability array is going to be the availability number that we had here so this is going to be the first item in that availability array and this is going to be the second. So that should save just the number for us of the availability and we'll save that back into our item. Let's just look at two other ones quickly. So just converting the review to a integer. So we'll just convert that so the number of reviews, make sure that it's an int. So we're just going adapter.get and then we're using our int and putting the string in inside the brackets and saving that back into the number views variable. And last of all, we mentioned the star rating and we want to turn the star rating into an integer also. So to do that, we can just 
get the stars, split the string using the split function again. We've got the array. We take the second value in the array, convert it to lowercase, and then depending on what the value is in that variable, is it 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then we save the stars value as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So pretty easy. Nothing too complicated there. So that's everything I wanted to cover for the pipelines. So as you can see, there's a huge amount of data processing that you can do on pipelines. And it's a good idea to have a look at your data, do one run of it, like we did in part five, and then have a look at your data and actually see what you can fix, what needs to be fixed up, what looks okay, what doesn't look okay. Sometimes you'll get a missing piece of data, there'll be blanks, but this is a process of refinement. So the first time around, you might only, you know, add in two things to your item pipeline, you run it again and you notice something else is wrong and you add in another piece into this pipeline. So the next thing you wanna do, we talked about this in part three, is if you've got a pipeline, you wanna go into your settings and you wanna make sure that the pipeline is enabled. So we've got our spider middlewares, our downloader middlewares, our extensions, and as you can see here, we've got our item pipelines. So this book scraper pipeline should correspond to the name of our class here. And if I put that in, you can see they're the same. So that should work because this is also generated by Scrapey when you generate the project. So it generally works as long as you uncomment this section here. So if everything was done correctly, we should be able to now run our spider and see the result with all the data processed just as we want it to be processed here. If there's any errors, they'll pop up and we can fix them and run it again. So I'm just going to make sure I'm in my project and then just run scrapey list to make sure everything's working and then run scrapey crawl book spider. Hopefully there is no issues. Okay, straight away I can see there's an error being returned. So I'm just going to stop my spider. So none type, none type object has no attribute next call. And we can just scroll up and double check that. So spider must return request item or none. Got item meta in get. Okay, so let's sort out this error. So if we just go back to our bookspider.py file, you can see the error is because I'm returning book item, I'm yielding book item, and instead it should be book underscore item. So that should fix the issue. And if I do a scrapey crawl again, this time I'll actually get it to go into another file. We do it call clean data.json. So it's the hyphen capital O clean data.json. And hopefully there's no other errors. There does look like there's another error because if I check clean data.json, there's nothing there. Okay, so I'll just close it again. And you can see, okay, error processing, availability. Does it give us anything else? So it says pipelines.py line 21. Tuple object has no attribute strip. So we can go to our pipelines line 21. Okay, so we have our value.strip and it's saying tuple object has no attribute strip. So let's just print out the value of value. 
let's just add in something above it so we can just see where it is in the output and try run it one more time and if we stop it again and scroll up we should be able to see that we've got our stars and we've got in stock available 19 and it is indeed being returned in a tuple at, with the second value there's nothing there so obviously we need to reference the first value in the tuple so we need to just do that so adding the square brackets and zero should return just the string that we're looking for and then dot strip can act on this string so if we remove our print statements save that and we'll try run it again and it looks like there's some errors coming in there we can just check our file there's nothing in here yet so i'll go ahead and stop the spider from running and we can see an error here pipelines.py line 21 in process item so that's still giving it a bit this line but this time it's saying type error none type object is not scriptable so I know what this error is I've had it before so this is coming up because we're getting all the field names which are a from our items.py so it's getting all these different field names here it's looping through them and one of these field names is not being found so if we look at our spider and compare all these guys here versus what we have here i think i've spotted the one already so i think it's this upc field unique product code i think it stands for and if you look here we don't have book item upc so i can just add that in now so i'll add that in here and save that so now we should have this which should correspond to this and we should have no more errors so let's run that again and this time we should see our clean data.json file filling up so everything looks good there open up the clean data.json we've got what looks like all the data we wanted so we can go ahead and just stop the spider we don't need it to, to collect all 1000 records we can just double check that everything did go in correctly so you can see just by either checking the file or scrolling up did everything get processed the way you wanted to get processed so did the price get get processed correctly is it now a double the product type is the first part lowercase yes it is the number of stars is now an integer so it looks like everything that went through our pipelines.py got processed correctly we can scroll up and check the category as well and the availability so everything worked out so that's just how we go through using pipelines and items I hope that's given you a good idea of how you can use items and pipelines yourselves to clean the data that you're scraping. And in part seven, which we'll be looking at next, we'll be looking at how we can use pipelines to save our data into databases and also how to use feed exporters in a bit more detail. So see you in part seven, guys. So for part seven of our Scrapey Beginners course, we're going to look at all the different ways we can save data. So all that data we've scraped in the last few parts, we're just going to see how can we 
uh, save it to different file formats, and then eventually look at databases. So first off, we're gonna look at via the command line, how what commands we need to run to save it to different file formats. Then we're going to look at how we can do that instead via the feed settings, which we can set in our settings or in our main spider file. And then once we've done that, we're going to go on and look at saving data directly into a database using the pipelines. So if you've done part six with us, you know all about pipelines by now, and we'll be using those pipelines in part seven to save the item um, data into the database directly. If you're just joining us now, you can download the uh, code from our GitHub repo. We'll have links for that and you can follow on from just this part seven. To get going, I'm just going to go into my book scraper folder, make sure I'm in the right place and then run scrapey crawl and the name of our spider scrapey crawl book spider dash capital o and then book data.csv so this is going to output the data into a csv format which is comma separated values so that can be opened in excel and as you can see the data is all there correctly. Okay, so we can stop that now. And if we scroll to the bottom, we can see we have 321 rows. So if you want to append data onto a file, instead of the hyphen or dash capital O, you can do a lowercase o. And then if we do the same name again, bookdata.csv, and enter, it should start appending on the data here. So instead of overwriting the file every time, if we close the file, open it back up, you can see we're already up to over 500 records. So the file doesn't update automatically. Sometimes it can take a couple of seconds or you have to close it and reopen it. So as you can see, we're up to 700 records there. And if I run it once more and do a capital O, it will overwrite that. There you go. So it's after wiping the file and now filling it again. Okay, so that's the difference with the overwriting or appending. And you've seen just by changing the file format at the end of your file name, is how you can specify types of files that you want to write into. So here we're going to do it again, but we're going to do it in JSON file format. So we have a new file is created, bookdata.json. As you can see, it's in JSON format. And the other one is the comma separated values format. Now let's move on and look at how we can specify where the data will be saved in our settings file. So if we open up our settings file, what we can do is use the feeds. So what we do is just add in a feed section. And here we're saying save the data into a file called data.json. So let's just call ours booksdata.json and the format is going to be JSON. So if I delete the two files we've just been using there and save what I have in my settings and rerun it, except this time remove the dash O and the name of the file. And if I just go ahead and run my spider we've seen it's just created a books data.json because I've specified it here. And it's all in the correct format. So I'm just gonna go ahead and stop my spider. And the next thing I wanna do is just show you guys how you can specify the feed data in your spider. So to do that, we can use the custom settings 
So this just enables you to overwrite anything you have in your settings file and you can just specify it in your spider. So we just need to specify what we want to overwrite and we're going to overwrite our feed and we would then put our feed settings in here. So if it sees that the feeds are set here, it will overwrite what we have in our settings.py file. So this is just an easy way that if you guys want to specify certain settings, you can do them here. They don't all have to be in your settings.py file. One important thing to note as well with our feeds, when we either set it in settings or in custom settings, is we need to set the overwriting. So like we did earlier, we just have overwrite true or overwrite false because it depends on where you're storing the data, what the default is for that setting. So it's better just to specify that we want to overwrite the file or not. We can just have it there and run it and it'll overwrite our current file. So now that we have that, the next thing we want to look at is how to save our data into databases using our pipelines. So I've gone ahead and I've already installed MySQL. So MySQL is a very popular database, which you can get yourselves just by going to mysql.com site and their download section. And you can just choose your operating system. So if you've got Windows, obviously have it for Windows, click download and install it. And they have for many other operating systems the available downloads there too so once you've downloaded and installed that you should be able to then make sure it's installed correctly just by running mysql and then dash dash version so as you can see here i have version 8.0.32 for mac os 11 and that's the latest 8.0.32 so that's installed for me so the next thing I'm going to do is just connect into my MySQL. So I can just type MySQL and then if it's a simple install and you've just installed it, you should be able to just hit enter and it brings you straight in. And you know you're connected in because you've got MySQL here. And then you can just say show databases and it shows you the databases. So I've already gone ahead and created one called books that's there, but you obviously won't have that if you just install it, so you want to create a database. So you just do create database books, and then it'll say created. I've already got the database already there, so it says database exists for me. So we need a database to actually save our things into, and once it's set up, it'll be there in your list, and you just do show databases to get the list of databases that are available. So we can exit out of that once we have our database created. You might have to connect in to your MySQL if you've set up a username and password or with a different host if you've, so you could do host localhost minus u for user root and minus p if you've got a password and then it'll prompt you for a password. So depending on what you have, so that also works to connect in. Uh, if I'd set up a password, it would have asked me for a password beforehand. So if you just type MySQL, you can usually get in if you already haven't got a password set up or if you're using a different host like DigitalOcean or some other third party provider, you can link, stick the URL to where your database is hosted there. So we've got our database set up. And the next thing we want to do is we want to install our MySQL connector. So just to make sure that Python is able to connect to our database. So I'm just going to paste in the command for that. And you guys can have a look at my screen there and type it in. So it's going to install the MySQL and MySQL connector Python packages 
with using pip again. So just go ahead and run that. And now that I have that, I should be able to start working on the pipeline. So we can just go directly under our existing book scraper pipeline and we're going to create a, a new class and we're just going to call that save to MySQL pipeline. And then we're going to import our MySQL connector to help us connect in. And we're going to initially just, when this pipeline is initialized, we're going to set up our connection and then set up our cursor. So I'll show you guys now what that entails. So we have this init function here. So this is going to start up when our spider initializes this class. We have, we're using the MySQL connector.connect here to set up the connection. We've got our host, our username, password. If you have a password, you have to add it in here. And then the database that we just created, books. So I can save all that. And then we have the cursor, which is used to execute the commands. So I have that set up here and that's saved into self.cur. So we can use it further in other functions. So the next thing we want to do is we're going to add in that we want a new table to be created if there is no table to store the data. So this can just be handy in case you are running this over and over again, or you're testing, you might want to go in, drop the table. And if you don't want to remember, did I just create that, is that table there or not? You can have this there. So that will just make sure that there's a table there. So it creates a table, if it doesn't exist, called books. And that table will have the following columns, ID, URL, title, UPC, product type, everything that we've already been scraping from the page, all the different data points. So it will set up all these different columns, including a primary key called ID. And then all the data will be able to save into the columns that we want it to be saved into. So we'll have the table set up if it's not already set up. So that's, we don't have to go in and manually set it up in MySQL ourselves. And the next thing we'd want to look at is we're going to again use the process item function. So we've already had that in our other pipeline, but we're going to add it in here. And this is where we're going to have our insert statement. So it's going to insert our data that we have in our item. So here it is. So it's pretty simple. So using the cursor that we've already defined above, we're going to say, please execute this command, insert into books, URL title, UPC product type, all the pieces of data that we've already scraped. So once that insert statement is there, we have to use commit to make sure that the insert is actually executed correctly. And then we just return the item so that if we add one more layer to our pipeline that the item is returned and the next piece of our pipeline can also continue. The only other thing we need to add in now is we want the connection to our database to be closed once the spider is finished. So to do that, we just add in that on close spider. So this is just a function that Scrapey looks for. If close spider is there, it executes close spider once the spider is ready to close at the end. So inside in close spider, we just add in cursor close and connection close. So we're just closing the cursor and the connection just so that this stuff isn't kept open and using memory if we're executing this lots and lots of times we don't want all this memory to be taken up with cursors and connections that are not being used. So now that we have that we need to go to our settings and we need to enable our new pipeline. So we're just going to copy the existing line and we're going to say 
execute our pipeline after this um, existing one. So we want the data to be cleaned first, and the second step is save the data into our MySQL database. So we're going to just copy the class name, go to settings, paste that in here, and then the only thing we need to do is we need to change this number here. So I don't think I've talked about this number yet. So what this number is, is that it's just the order in which the items in the item pipeline have precedence. So the lower the number, the higher the order of importance, the first thing that's going to be executed. So in this case, number 300 is going to be executed first, and then number 400 is going to be executed after that. So this is an easy way for us to say, please execute this pipeline first and this pipeline second. And if you had multiple pipelines, you can just use these numbers. It doesn't have to be three or 400. It can be any number you want. I've just picked three and 400 for now. Okay, so now that we have that, we should be able to go ahead and check our database to see did the items get saved into the database correctly. So let's do that now. So as before, we're just going to do scrapey crawl book spider and it should kick off so we have several books after being scraped so let's stop our spider the next thing we want to do is we want to log back into our mysql console and then we want to show database this is, and then we want to use books this just enables us to select from that database so once we're using the books database we want to just show tables and we can see that the table was created that we asked it to create books and then we can do select all from books and we can see that there's 138 rows there and that the data looks like it's saved correctly. We've got the name of the books, all the other pieces of data that we had, the description, the price, the tax, the availability, the category, it all looks like it's saved there correctly. So we can drop the table. So dropping the table just basically removes the table so that it won't exist. Drop table books if we wanted to start again, because otherwise what it's going to do is it's going to keep appending on to the database. So we can see if we show tables that there's no more tables in the database now, but our pipeline creates a new table anyway. So that's fine. So that's how we create a simple database, get it set up and have a simple pipeline script that once the data is cleaned up with our first pipeline that we did in part six, it then inserts it into a MySQL database in this tutorial that we've just done, again, using our pipelines. So obviously if you're more familiar with using Postgres databases or other types of databases, you can just modify the pipeline slightly. We will have available articles where it'll show you the exact code you need to use um, a pipeline to insert the database into a Postgres database also. So you guys can have a look at the articles that we'll attach and we'll also have the code repos there for you guys to just download and play around with too. So I think that's it for part seven. In part eight, we're going to be looking at how we can use the user agents and headers to get around issues with being blocked when we're trying to scrape different websites. So we're going to be looking at user agents and headers in detail what they are, how to use them. So see you in part eight, guys. Thanks for watching.
Welcome to part eight of the Scrapey Beginners course for Free Code Camp. So in part eight, we're going to be looking at why we get blocked when we're scraping the web, what types of websites might block us, and then how to use user agents and headers to bypass instances where we're getting blocked while scraping. So we'll start off by going straight into what headers are. So if you go to the site we've been scraping in the last few parts, books.toscrape.com, you open, inspect an element on the page, go to the networking tab, and then simply refresh the page. If you've got doc selected or all selected, you will see what we want to see. So because this is a just a simple website, the HTML is sent to us and we can see it returned in the preview. So you can see all the HTML is there and that's what we end up scraping when we are using Scrapey. But if we look at the headers tab, we can see everything that is sent when we request this page and you've got the request URL which is just the URL of the site we're trying to scrape. You've got the method. Are we trying to get the page? Are we posting data to the page? And then you've got things like the status code and so on, so on. Now, the important stuff for us are the request headers. So this is everything that we send when we make a request to books.toscrape.com. And as part of this, the most important part for us in this part eight of the tutorial is the user agent. So the user agent gives you all the important information about who you are to the server that you're requesting the web page from. So here we can see if I copy this string and I've got this site useragentstring.com and it lets you paste in and analyze user agents. So this is all the stuff that is, is contained when we make a request to a website. Straight away, it knows that we're using Chrome, what version of Chrome we're using, the render engine that we're using, your operating system. So I'm using OS X, I'm using an Intel CPU. So all this kind of data is sent with every request you make automatically. Now, this is fine when you're browsing the web or you're building your spiders and you're doing a bit of testing, but if you're doing any sort of large scale scraping on any kind of commercial sites, you're more than likely going to start to get blocked. So a lot of sites think, I don't know, Amazon, Walmart, any kind of big e-commerce sites, most of them will have some form of antibots that stop you from scraping. Now you might say, why do they want to stop me? I'm not doing anything bad. I just want to collect their data. Well, they'll say, well, this is our data. We own the website. This is only for our customers, so on and so forth. Now, obviously, you need to look at the terms and conditions of the site you're scraping and judge for yourself if it's legal or illegal. The rule of thumb to go by is that if it's publicly available and you don't have to log in and give your details, then it's more than likely okay to scrape the data of the website. If you have to log in first and by logging in, you might be agreeing to certain terms and conditions, then more than likely the website will have that in their terms and conditions that you are not allowed to scrape their data. So that's up to you guys to decide on a case by case basis. But for a lot of simpler sites, like the one we're, we're scraping in our tutorial series here, this site has no antibots on it. So there is nothing which will block us, even if we have the same user agent. So therefore it knows if, if it gets a thousand requests from this Chrome and my Mac that it knows that it's me, 
then it's it's not going to do anything about it. It's not going to block me when I'm trying to scrape all these books off this website. But that's obviously because this website is there for people to learn on. So that's kind of why we get blocked. So the other things that they look for is they look at the IP address of the machine that you're using. So that's also a, a very simple way for websites to block who uh, the requests because they can see your IP address every time you make a request. So they normally look for the IP address and they might set something in your cookies in your session. So they might set some kind of flag or counter there so they know that it's you coming back every time. So it's mainly IP address, the cookies or the sessions, and then the headers in general, and as part of that, the user agents. So the difference between headers and user agents is that headers is everything that we have here. So it, it, it encompasses things like the accepted things that are returned. Does it take HTML or does it take images? You know, what do we accept back? What does the browser accept back as a as a response? The things like the language, encoding, and then the user agent is just one subset of the overall request headers. So for some sites that are not too complex, if we change the user agent each time we make a request, the website will think that it is a different browser and a different computer looking for the data on the site every time. So it'll let the request go through. However, for more complicated sites, they'll look at everything in the request headers and they'll want everything to be different or at least slightly different. So for example, I have Mac OS here. So if Mac OS is coming every single time and they match that, plus they can see my Google Chrome version here as well, and the version of Chromium, then they might say, okay, this looks too similar, even though the user agent is changing every time, this looks suspicious, and they might flag my requests and block my requests, or at least they might not even block them, but they might throw up a capture page, so that if you're not actively solving the capture, the requests are being blocked. So for the most com for the more complicated sites, we need to also be changing the entirety of the request headers, not just the user agents. So there are the kind of main things we need to look at is how can we change our IP address to stop getting blocked? How can we change our user agents and also the entirety of the request headers for the more complicated sites? So that's what we're going to be doing in part eight and part nine is looking how to bypass being blocked by changing these different parts that are sent when we make a request for a web page. Okay, so now that we've gone through the theory of it, of what is in a header and a user agent and what details the websites are looking at when we make a request, let's go to our spider and implement different user agents every time, how we can get multiple different user agents, insert them into our spider, use middlewares to do that, and then also do it for request headers. Okay, so if we go back to our spider, we're continuing on from part seven. If you're just joining us for this part eight, we'll have a link to download the code so you can hop in and start right here with us now. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just go to my settings and disable the pipeline which saves the data to MySQL because I don't need to do that for the purpose of this part eight. So the next thing is I'm going to open up my spider and I'm going to set a user agent. So I'm going to do that. The simplest way to do it is actually to go to our settings. And in the settings, we can directly set a user agent. So just like I had 
shown you in the browser, its user agent, and then it contains all the available information about the user who is requesting the web data. So here you can see Mac OS X, you can see it's an iPad, etc, etc, etc. So this is just an example. If you wanted to send this user agent with every single request, you can set it in the settings. Now, obviously, that doesn't make sense because it's not changing. So within 10 or 20 requests, the website is going to say, hey, this is the same person every time. They're making a lot of requests. They're probably web scraping and they'll ask for a capture or they'll block us. So this is not sufficient. This is just if you want to set one specific user agent for every single request. So for now, we'll remove that again. And we will look at how we can create a list and rotate through that list. So what we're going to do is go back to our spider and we are going to create a list of user agents. So here's one I've pasted in from our article. You can check out our article and paste it in yourself as well. And we also have this available in the GitHub repo. So you don't have to type out everything here yourself. So we've got a list. The next thing we want to do is add the user agent into every single request that we make. So to do that, we can go to where we make the request every time and we can specify that we want our user agent to be overwritten. To do that, we just go to where we have our callback on our book URL and we would do something like this. So we would have our headers and we're saying overwrite the user agent part of our headers and we'll do this with our user agent list. So we just need to specify self dot user agent list and then we'll import random so we can switch between different things at random and we'll do self dot user agent list here and I think that's all we need. So what this does is we're saying add this user agent to our headers when we make the request and pick a random user agent from between zero and the length of the user agent. So it's going to pick one of these guys at random and insert it into our header. Now, obviously, you need to add this line that we just added to everywhere that is making a response dot follow. So we can add it here as well. And I think that's the only two places we have them. So we should be able to run that and it should send a different user agent every time. But as you might guess, this isn't really enough to spoof a large scale website. They'll see if you're doing thousands of requests, okay, there's only five different user agents and they'll say, we need to block this user. So that brings us on to how we can use a fake user agent API to give us a massive list of thousands of user agents. And then we can loop through that list of thousands of user agents. But instead of having them all here directly in our spider, what we would do is we would implement a middleware and we would add it into our middlewares.py. And in this middleware is where we would rotate through all the different fake user agents that we would be getting from a fake user agent API. So that's what we're going to look at next. We're going to create a middleware and we're going to ask for those fake user agents from the third party website 
get those user agents returned to us and then pass those into our request headers. So to get those request headers, we can go back to our browser and go to scrapeops.io where you can sign up for a free account and then using the API key that you get, you can use the free headers generator API. So this is what happens when I use their headers API. I can specify that I want user agents. I put in my API key there, make a request, and it gives me back a result with a bunch of different randomly generated user agents. So once you're actually logged in, you can go to their fake headers API section, and that's where it shows you your API key. And if you want to generate browser headers, you use this URL. If you want to generate user agents, you use that URL. And then the response comes back like this, just as I showed you here. So I can just stick that in and it gives me the result back. So you can specify the number of headers you want and it sends you back all the user agents, our browser headers that we can then use in our middleware. So depending on the language you're using as well, you can specify different examples. So this is where I got the URL to use for here. And if you're using Node or PHP or Ruby, you could use the other tabs to see the examples. But we're using Python with Scrapey, so we have everything we need here. So now that we have an API endpoint where we can get our fake user agents and fake headers, we can go back to our middlewares file and we can start creating our middleware that will handle everything to do with the fake um, user agents. So I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom and I'm going to start a, a new class and I'm going to be importing a couple of things that we're going to need. So I'm going to import URL encode, which will encode our URLs rand int to pick a random integer so we can use that to pick one from the list and requests as well. So I've created a new class called scrapeops fake user agent middleware. That can be obviously whatever you want it to be. And then we're going to set it up. So again, we have our init function, which gets kicked off when the class is initialized. And in here, we first off set some of our settings. So we're going to want the scrape ops API key, which is going to be the API key that we get for free from here. So that's where we have our API key. We also have the URL, which you can see here. And so we've got our endpoint. And what else? Oh yeah, do we want it to be enabled or not? And the number of results we want to specify to come back. So we'll go ahead and set those all up in our settings. So I'm going to set my API key. Obviously, you guys set that to whatever your one is. Set up the endpoint. And uh, the endpoint is going to be user agents. And paste that in. And then we have our, if we have enabled, so that's true. There you go. And the num requests, which we can set to, to 50. We can save that and save that as well. So this part up here just makes sure that we have access to our crawler settings when the class is initialized. So as you can see here and here, we've got two functions. Um, that means when the class is initialized, get the user agents list and enable it. 
So I'm going to first off get the user agents list. So I'm going to add that one in. So that function looks like the following. We've got the payload set, which is the API key. And then we're saying if the number of results is not none, set the payload number of results. And then we want to make a get request to the API endpoint with our parameters, which have been URL encoded here using the URL encode function. Then that goes off, goes to the scrape ops endpoint and then gets the user agents and comes what comes back gets put into the response. Then we're using .json just to parse it into a JSON response. And then we can have our user agents list saved into user agents list. So once we've got that, we're going to just create two more simple functions underneath. The first one, just get random user agent, fairly self-explanatory. Just get one, getting one user agent from the list that's been returned and return that selected user agent. And then we have just this check to see if the fake user agents is either active or inactive. And then once all that's set, we can actually put that into practice with our process request, which is one of the scrapey functions. That's It's one of the functions that scrapey will look for when you're using middlewares. And it then sees that we've specified something to happen when it goes to process a request, and then it executes the following. So when it sees process request, it goes in here, it gets a random user agent, sticks it in here, and then it sets the header user agent to be the random user agent. So I hope that makes sense. I think it's fairly self-explanatory. We're just getting a list of user agents. And then with process request, we are getting a random user agent and we are assigning that to our header, request header. So when we go off and ask our books to scrape site for the book or the list of books, it sticks in that random user agent into the user agent of the request. The only thing to do then is to stick our middleware. This is a step you mustn't forget. It's very easy to forget it. I've forgotten it loads of times. And then <laughs> sometimes you can be trying to debug things after. So you want to go to your downloader middlewares, open that and add in your new middleware. So again, as we did in the last one, the lower number has higher priority. So we don't need to have the other downloader middleware, we just want our uh, the middleware we just created, our scrape ops fake user agent middleware, because this middleware up here is just the generated one that we don't need at the moment. Okay, we'll go ahead, run our spider now, check that it's working, it should be working fine. And then we will look at just doing the same thing, but instead of having a user agent come back from scrape ops, we'll be asking for a list of fake headers. So we'll create a second middleware and we'll just have the whole fake header as opposed to just the subsection user agent part. So just to make sure that the headers are being attached correctly, because you might say, well, I know for sure that it's working. We can just add in a very simple print to our process request. So I'm just going to stick this in here. Two print statements, one saying new header attached and the other one saying the new user agent. So it'll print out the user agent that we've just attached, the random user agent. So 
that should print that out then to our console and we should be able to see that a new user agent is being attached every time that a request is being processed. Now, the only other thing we have to do is go back and remove what we added in earlier, which was this headers part here because it's being done in middleware. So we don't have to specify it for every request here. So I'm just going to remove that and I'm going to remove it here as well. So as you can see, there's always multiple ways of doing it, either kind of manually adding things into the spider, setting them in the settings. If you just want it once off in the settings, if you want a simple case in the spider, and if you want something more complex in the middleware. So you've kind of got your three different ways of adding your user agents or headers in. So now that we've removed that, we don't need this user agents list up here. We can remove that. Let's save it. And we should be able to just run our spider again. So scrapey crawl and book spider. And if everything's gone to plan, we should see, I'll just close the spider straight away and scroll up so we can have a look and see that everything. So it looks like all the data is coming back as it was before. We don't expect anything to change there because we, we're not going to be getting blocked by the books to scrape.com site anyway. But if we scroll up, I think we should see. Here you go. So here is where we can see the all the new headers that are coming in. So you can see the Chrome version there is different. Sometimes it looks like it's using Edge as well. So you can see there's multiple different headers coming back and then they are being attached in with the process request. So that all seems to be working fine, just as we wanted it to. And we made sure that we had it enabled in the settings as well, in the downloader middlewares. So we have it enabled there, as well as enabled up here and the number of user agents coming back from the API set here. So everything is as it should be. One other thing to note is that this robots txt underscore obey is set to true. If we're starting to do more complex sites, we would set this to false. So every site, or most sites, have a robots.txt file, which is usually one of the first things that a spider will look for. So Scrapey does this automatically every time it looks at a site. It first goes off and checks, does a site have a robot.txt file? And in that robots.txt file, is usually specified things like the pages on a site, is this site open to being scraped? And if it's open to being scraped, what pages are not allowed to be scraped or what pages are allowed to be scraped? Now, obviously, any crawlers that go out, crawl different websites, don't have to obey this robots.txt file. You know, it's, it's a piece of code, it's gonna go off and do what you tell it. This is up to you to decide, you know, do you want your spider to obey it or not? A lot of big sites will have like, okay, uh, if you're a Google spider, you're allowed to crawl and scrape our data. If you're not a Google spider, don't scrape our data. So if they have that in their robots.txt and you have it set to obey is equal to true, your spider will go, see it's not supposed to scrape the site and it'll shut down. So if you're having issues and you have this set to true, try setting it to false. Okay, so now that we've gone through what robots.txt entails, let's go and create our next middleware. So this time, instead of having middleware that just replaces the user agent every time, we're going to create a new middleware. So go to middlewares.py and this new middleware is going to create a new header every time using the data that it gets back from the fake browser header endpoint. 
So I'm just going to paste in the code here and then talk through it for you guys. So if we go up to the top, we start off again with just a simple class name, scrape ops, fake browser, header, agent, middleware. That can be whatever you want. We pull in the settings that we need. This will get everything from the settings file. And then it kicks off get headers list, which calls out to the API endpoint. It does a get request here to the scrape ops endpoint, returns the response, converts it to JSON, and then we've got a list of headers. And then in the process request, which gets processed with every request, we have this get random browser header function, which will get the random browser header from the list that we just asked for from scrape ops. So then we have this random browser header and we can assign all the other headers, not just user agent like we did in the middleware above, but we can also modify all these other parameters in the header. So you don't have to modify all of them. You can modify certain ones. Again, this is up to you to play around with and decide which ones you need, which ones you don't need. With scraping, everything is really a case by case basis because every website is different. But we're giving you here everything you need to play around with. So you might find certain headers need to be modified more than others. We have our request.headers being updated. And then that is just like the one above everything we need. Let's go ahead now and add the settings that we need. So we have some of the settings already set here. So we have the uh, browser endpoint. There's a default set there. We can set our fake browser header enabled to true here to make sure it runs. And then the num requests is going to be the same as here. It's already set. And the API key is already set as well. So again, you get your own API key for that. And I think we should be able to just go to settings now and make sure we have the middleware enabled. So I'm copying the class name, going to settings, going down to downloader middlewares. And where we had the fake user agent middleware, I'm just going to overwrite that. So we have our fake browser header agent middleware. So I'm going to save that and then just go and run the spider again and it should work correctly. So yeah, there seems to be lots of books getting scraped. So it seems to be working correctly. I can stop it and just as we did before to double check that the headers are being set correctly we can just stick underneath a simple print statement that shows the headers are set to what we wanted them to be set to so if we run our spider it should show that there's multiple different headers so i'm just stopping it again and looking at the output once we get past the book data. Okay, so here there's some headers. So new header attached, which is what we have here. And then we can see we have things like, let's see, accept the user agent. So, okay, so we have the user agent, Mozilla 5. Do we have accept? So we have accept um, the text, HTML, everything we wanted there. I'm just trying to see, can we see in here that both of them are different to each other? Yeah, so here, for example, you can see this user agent is using Chrome 103.0, 5060.134, and up here it's using a different version of Chrome. So it's using 103.0.50.60.114. So you can see it is 
changing in each request. So that's exactly what we want to show you how to do. So I think that concludes part eight. In part nine, we'll be going into how to use proxies to bypass the anti-bot blockers that websites have as well. So instead of kind of handling everything ourselves and trying to bypass the anti-bots by updating our own headers, we can see that there's commercial things out there for you to do that with. And there's also things like proxy lists that are free to use as well. And we we'll look at how to integrate those into your Scrapey project as well. So see you in part nine, guys. So in part nine of the Scrapey Beginners course, we're going to be looking at everything to do with proxies. So we're going to be going through what are proxies and why do we need them? And then we're going to be looking at the three most popular ways to integrate proxies into your projects. So let's get started. So in part eight, we were looking at user agents and requests and the headers we pass in when we're making the requests to the website you're looking to scrape. We discussed and looked at how if you change your headers, and change your user agents, you can basically make it look as if you are multiple people accessing the website you're trying to scrape. Now, there's one thing we also mentioned in part eight, which is that the data that also is being transmitted with your request is usually your IP address. So this IP address is your unique identifier, and that's what is used to make sure the data comes back to your machine. So every machine will have an IP address and that's how the requests get to and from your machine. Think of it as like your house has an address, your computer must also need an address and this is your IP address. So if we change the user agents every time when we're sending the requests, that's fine. But if we're changing the user agents every time, but we still have the same IP address, then the site that we're scraping is very likely to know that we are the same machine that is requesting their data every time. So they're very likely to block us straight away. So that's why changing our IP address as well as our user agent and headers is very important. So just the user agent and headers might work if it's not very sophisticated type of website that you're trying to scrape. But if you're going to anything that's complex at all, you will need to rotate your IP address. And that's where proxies come into play. So let's first off look at the first method is that we're going to be looking at is using proxy lists. So these are lists of IP addresses and ports that belong to multiple different servers all over the world. So there's lots of these machines that are available to bypass our requests will go via that machine before it goes to the website we're trying to scrape and then it'll come all the way back via that machine as well now there's pros and cons to every one of the of the three integration methods we're going to look at so the pros of proxy lists like this are that obviously the proxies that lists that you can get online, a lot of them are free. So like this one here, freeproxylist.net, you can go there and you can select from a list of different countries, uh, select your protocols and you can check the uptime. There's also another list, which is very handy on geono.com forward slash free proxy list. Here you also have IP address, port, country, uptime, response, etc. So here there's 9,000 proxies online in 136 countries. But the downside is of using these lists is that because they're free, so many people are using them that they're very likely to either have very poor response times and take very long time to actually route your traffic through them or else they can be already blacklisted. Because think of it, if someone has already used them to scrape millions of pages from maybe the same site that you're going to look to scrape data from, then there's a very high likelihood that that website could already 
have discovered this IP address and blocked it. So the pro is that it's free, the cons are that it can take a long time and there's a very high likelihood that if it's free that it's already been used too much and it could be blocked. So we're going to go ahead anyway and try with a few of these IP addresses and a few ports from these two sites and the way we want to integrate them into our project is we're going to use this GitHub project which integrates with Scrapey and it's called Scrapey Rotating Proxies. So we'll have a link to this available but you can just do pip install scrapey-rotating-proxies and go to your terminal and paste that in and run it. Now, I already have it installed, so it's going to say requirement already satisfied for me, but for you guys, you should see it installing there. Now, we're continuing on part nine from part eight. So if you're looking for the code for where we are starting at now, we'll have that available in a GitHub repo, which we'll link to. So you can continue on from here with us. So now that we have that installed, we can go ahead and we can add our proxy list in. So as you probably guess, everything is going to go into our settings file as with everything else that's part of our project. And these are just dummy domain IP addresses, but this is the idea. So you can have as many, you could have a hundred different IP address and ports in here but we're just going to put three or four just for the purpose of showing you how it works. So let's go back to our free proxy list and take two of these guys. So we want the IP address in the port. Now, obviously, depending on your use case, you might need a um, you might need a proxy from a specific country, or you might need a proxy with a very good uptime or response time. So that's for you guys to search in the search boxes on the site here. Okay, so I've got three of them there. And the next thing I want to do is enable the middleware. So this project that I've just pip installed, this scrapey rotating proxies, will have installed a middleware. But to actually make sure that the middleware works, we need to add it to our downloader middlewares. And that's where we can make sure it's enabled. So I've just done, gone ahead and done that there. I've added them in. So, and as you can see, I've left the other two middlewares that we had from part eight in here as well. So obviously they don't have to be here. I can also remove them, but I might as well leave them in for now. They're not going to do any harm. They're just adding in a different request header. So let's save that and then the other thing I wanted to quickly show you is that if you'd had all the proxies already in a file, you could do something as simple as just saying the rotating proxy list path is equal to and then the path to your file. Now, obviously, we don't have a file with a bunch of IPs and ports, but that's where you would put it if that's what you're wanting to do. So let's just quickly remove that. And now we can go ahead and we can run our spider and see the results. So I'm just going to do scrapey crawl and the name of the spider. I'm just going to make sure I'm in my project. Scrapey crawl book spider. So it's going to go ahead and run. You can see the header that was attached from part eight where we were adding the new header. And now this can take a good bit of time. So as you can see here, this rotating proxies 
dot middlewares has pointed out that it has zero good proxies, zero dead proxies, and three unchecked proxies. So that means that it's going to go ahead and it's first going to try and see can it actually send any requests through the proxies that we've listed here. So this can take a good bit of time depending on the quality of the proxies that we've got. Obviously, I have no idea how good the ones in that free list are because they change every day, every hour. There's new ones added and there's ones removed. And then as soon as they're added, they're being used by hundreds, if not thousands of other users. So this is the good thing about this middleware is that it checks, can it actually use it? And as you can see here, it's just retrying our books to scrape URL with another proxy because one of them failed to work. So it's just a, a process of waiting. So it's moved one of the proxies into our dead pool and it's still got two that it wants to check. So this is just a process of waiting and letting the middleware do its work. So I'm going to leave that run for a few minutes and come back to it and we'll see did it actually manage to use any of those free proxies that were on that free proxy list. So I'll come back in one second and we'll see where we are. Okay, so I've just come back a few minutes later and it still hasn't managed to get any of our three proxies in the list to work. It's got two dead now. One, it's trying to reanimate. It's not looking good. So obviously the ones I've picked were probably already overly used, already could be blocked by the site we're trying to scrape. So here you can see obviously the major disadvantage of using free proxy lists online. Now there's lots of different places to get them. So depending on your source of the proxies, you may have much better luck at getting them to work. But it's really a process of trial and error. And while it's free, it can be painful to actually get up and running consistently and correctly. So we've had a look at how we can just plug in a bunch of different um, IP addresses and ports into our rotating proxy list and how we can use this middleware to use our proxies in our Scrapey project. But another way we can do this is using a proxy port. So what we would be using is a service which is provided by a proxy provider and they would give us a proxy IP address and port and they would handle changing the IP address every time and we wouldn't have to worry about compiling a list of proxies ourselves. So that's what we're going to look at next. So we can still be looking after our own user agents and our own headers, but the proxy provider would be dealing with everything to do with rotating a proxy list for us and making sure that the proxy list is of good quality and available all the time. So we wouldn't have to worry about that. Now there's lots of them out there and we're just going to look at one of them now. The one I've just going to show you now is called Smart Proxy. You can check them out at smartproxy.com and as they say, effortlessly scrape web data you need. So they've got some great deals and offers. And as you can see, they you know do things like bypassing captures, IP bans. They've got millions of proxies from millions of locations. And the plans they do entail residential and data center proxies. So we haven't talked about that yet, but residential proxies would be basically the data will be forwarded through residential IP addresses. So these are IP addresses that are mainly used by people's homes. So think of it, if someone is watching Netflix and browsing Facebook and looking at Google search, and then one or two of your 
requests are going via that IP address, then the website you're trying to scrape, let's say Amazon, is going to say, oh, well, I saw that IP address yesterday. They just bought something from me. So they're much more likely just to let that request go through without any issue. So that would be what residential proxies are. Then data center proxies would be, think of you know your traditional data centers with thousands of servers in a big room and your request would be routed through a data center and through the IP address that is belonging to one of the machines in the data center. So you have access to a lot more IP addresses in the residential side, but then the data center side are much quicker and there tends to be not as many data limits and they tend to be a bit cheaper as well. So that's the difference between residential and data center proxies. So you can sign up with them. Most proxy providers also give you a week or two of a free trial or a certain amount of free credits that you can use to test out their service. So if you guys go ahead, you can click get started there, sign up for an account. And then once you're logged in, if you go to the residential tab, because we're going to be using residential proxies for our next part now so click the residential tab and then you can either check out a pay-as-you-go plan where you pay per gigabyte of data that's transferred or you can go into regular or enterprise as well so i already have a plan set up with them so i'm going to go directly to the proxy setup next and this is where we will get our details which we will then put into our spider First off, we want to generate our username and password so we can put in any kind of combination of letters and numbers here, a password and click create and it creates a username and password. Once you have your username and password, you can grab these and put those into the username and password field here. Then our proxy location if it's important for your spider that you are scraping from a certain country. For example, if you are scraping an e-commerce site that will only show you specific products, if you're living in a certain country, then it is important to select the country here from this list. So for us, it doesn't matter. So we can leave it at random. Then for the session type, we want rotating because we don't want a fixed session every request can come from a different ip address and that doesn't matter for us right now and for the output format we're just going to pick http so that's going to then give us this string here which we can copy and use in our project so this is the endpoint where we're going to send our request to Smart Proxy is going to handle all the IP address rotation and all that stuff. And it's going to then send us back the response from the website we are trying to scrape. Now that we have our endpoint from Smart Proxy, the next thing we want to do is go back to our project. We want to disable the middleware we were using because that will no longer be needed because Smart Proxy is going to be looking after rotating our uh, proxies and it's going to be looking after some band detection stuff as well. So we can disable the two of them and the next thing we can do is go to our spider and we can go to where we have response.follow and in here we'll simply add in one more field, which is going to be meta and then the proxy information. So meta is equal to proxy and then our proxy details will go in here. So I can go back, grab my proxy endpoint and paste it in here. So that looks correct. And then I can also copy this and put it down where we also have response.follow below. 
so I'll add it in here too and that should be the two main places I need it for now. The other example which I'll show you in a second is that we can create a custom middleware which would insert the endpoint um, as well. So we'll do that once we get this to run correctly. We can now do scrapey crawl book spider and it should work for us. So scrapey crawl book spider and hopefully we have no issues. As I can see there's some things coming through. I can go to my books data JSON and I can see that there is the data coming through. So it looks like it's working correctly and it's all going via the smart proxy endpoint. So I can close down my spider and the next thing we can do is we can create a custom middleware for it. So just adding it in to our meta value here and adding in our proxy endpoint is fine if you've got a small project but if you've got a larger project it probably makes more sense just to make a custom middleware for it so i'm going to show you how to do that next so we'll scroll down to the bottom because we have our other middlewares in here already and we'll create a new middleware where we will be adding our endpoint details so we just make a new class called my proxy middleware it's going to again pull in our crawler settings and then it's going to get our proxy user proxy password proxy endpoint and proxy port from our settings so we need to go ahead and set those in our settings and then once it's got those it makes the user credentials it puts those credentials into a proxy authorization header for the request and then it has the url which is made with the endpoint and port and that then goes into the request.meta so let's go ahead now and in our settings fill out our proxy user password endpoint and port so we will just go here and I'll add them in now. So username, password, endpoint, and port. So I just need to change the password. Obviously your username and password are gonna be whatever you guys have made in your own dashboards with Smart Proxy. I'm just copying my details from here. And that looks fine. So I should be able to save that. And the next thing I need to do is to make sure my middleware is enabled. So again, going to my downloader middlewares and I'm going to add in my new middleware. So I can add that in there and save it. The next thing we want to do is try and run our spider again and see does it work but we will obviously remove what we did a second ago so that we can show it's all going via our new middleware. So let's just remove that, save it, and then try run our spider again. And it looks like the book details are coming through again. So I'm just going to close my spider. Now we can have a look at Smart Proxy and see the traffic usage. And as you can see, we have requests coming through. So there you go. We've got the user. And we've got our usage by gigabyte. So it's working just as we wanted it to work. Our requests are going through the smart proxy endpoint. Smart proxy is looking after 
the IP address rotation and it is sending us back the request. Then Scrapey is able to take the information out of the HTML and we have the data that we need. I think that's given you a very good overview of how we would use proxy port endpoints. So there's just one last thing I wanted to show you guys, which is proxy API endpoints. So this is, if you wanna go just a step further and not have to deal with the browser headers or the user agents or any things like that, and maybe you are scraping something which requires a headless browser to do JavaScript running for you, we can get that by using a proxy API. So again, it's a service where there's an endpoint, we're sending our request through that service, and then that service is making sure that certain things are enabled to make sure that the request gets us the page data. So what we're gonna do is we are going to show you how to use that now. And that is also going to be a paid service. And you can sign up for that by going to scrapeops.io, clicking get free account, signing up for it. You've got a thousand free credits there. And if you then, once you're logged in, go to the proxy aggregator page, go to the request builder, and you then have an API uh, key, which you can use, and you've got the proxy endpoint, which you can use as well in your spider. So once you've got your API key, we can move back to our book spider file, and we will start adding in a new function, which will help us send the traffic first to our new proxy provider. So this new function is gonna be called get underscore proxy underscore URL. And we're gonna pass in a URL to that function. And then we're gonna have an API key as part of this payload object. And we're obviously gonna put in an API key where we have our own API key that we got from ScrapeOps. So I'm gonna add mine in quickly now. I'm just going to copy and paste that in. And that then is gonna slot in here. This payload is gonna get URL encoded. So I need to import this URL encode from URL lib. And then it's going to create this new proxy URL. And then it's going to return that proxy URL. So this function is going to get the URL of the site that we want to scrape, and it's going to encode it along with our API key, and it's going to send it to this API endpoint. Once we've got that function created, the next thing we want to do is we want to add it in to where we use our current scrapey.request function. So we will have URL is equal to and then get proxy URL. And then the same down here, we'll be doing get proxy URL with our next page URL too. And the only other thing we need to add in now is a new function called start requests. So we'll add this in under our custom settings and I'll explain now what this does. So Scrapey looks for this function when you start up your spider. If you don't have it, it doesn't need it to run. It'll work off of your start URLs list here. But if you do have it, it will go in and work off of what you have in here. So what I've asked it to do is I'm saying, okay, when the spider starts up, run this function and inside in this function, run our get proxy URL, the same as we do down here, because we want 
the very first URL to also go to our proxy. So if we didn't have this function in here, what would happen is that the very first URL would actually not be sent to our proxy provider endpoint URL. So that would mean that there's a chance that the first, very first request would get blocked. So that's why we have this function, so that the very first URL is properly encoded and sent off using this get proxy URL. And once, so that's why we have start URLs and we're taking the first string inside of our start URLs. And then we're doing the callback is going to be our parse function. And then it's going to go on and it's going to work perfectly because it'll be going through get proxy URL for the rest of the requests as well. So that takes care of the very first call and this get proxy URL function get, takes care of making sure that all the requests are going to go via this proxy API endpoint. So then the request will come back with the response and the response will be able to be parsed in our parse book page like it was before. So we should be able to go ahead and run that. If we just do scrapey crawl book spider again and run that. Oh, there's one other thing. So it just did one request and stopped straight away. And that's because it's a very easy mistake to make. The allowed domains does not contain our proxy dot scrapeops.io so let's just add that in and if we rerun it it should there you go so we just close our spider and i'll show you that we have all the data is coming through so we've got our product type books the title the description it's all there so that's working perfectly it's going via our proxy API endpoint. And the next thing I want to do is I want to show you guys how instead of integrating this directly into our spider, we can use a proxy middleware that's been created especially by ScrapeOps. So we can just quickly pip install it and it makes things a bit easier if you are adding it to a project and you don't want to have to add this special get proxy URL function. So what we would do in this case is we would just pip install and then our new Python module, scrapeops-scrapey-proxy-sdk and install that. And then the next thing we would want to do is we would go to our settings and like we always do, add more settings. So let's just go down here and add in the settings we want. So it would be, again, our API key. If the script ops proxy is enabled, yes. And we'd be adding this line to our downloader middlewares. So I already have downloader middlewares. So I'm just going to add it here. So if I save that and I add my API key, from here into my settings. Okay, so I just want it here. Perfect. And um, I should just remove the get proxy URL from the places that we've been using that function because we don't need it anymore. And then it should run fine going through our middleware. So let's try and run that one more time and see does it work going via the scrape ups proxy middleware. And it looks like you have lots of requests going through. So if I just cancel that and we can check in our dashboard, if we have, so we have 
123 requests. So that looks like they all went to our books to scrape.com site. So we've 123 requests made. So it's working like it should. So that makes it very easy. If you want to get started with it, all you need to do is do that pip install um, scrape ops dash scrapey dash proxy SDK, add the two lines in here and the one line into your downloader middlewares. And then it will just send all your URLs via the scrape ops proxy endpoint. Now, obviously, you can make your own custom download or middleware as well, uh, like we did for our smart proxy example. That might be a bit more complex than needs be for, for this because there's already the uh, middleware that you can just pip install. So we will leave the example with our download or middleware in our article. So if you want to check out a long version of how to implement the downloader middleware using the ScrapeOps proxy API endpoint, we'll have that in our article and you can copy and paste that into your code and play around with that. So there's just one other thing. If you wanted to add some more um, functionality to the ScrapeOps proxy endpoint, you could add in for example, the following. So scrape ops underscore proxy underscore settings is equal to country US. So this would send all the traffic via US IP addresses. So if you're, for example, scraping an e-commerce website that needed to be only loaded via the US, so it would show US items only, you would do something like this, country us in your scrape ops underscore proxy underscore settings they also have other functions such as you can pass in if you want it to be the page to be javascript rendered and there's many other different parameters that you can pass in which will mean that certain things are switched on on your proxy provider side so that way instead of you having to do all this stuff on your side the proxy provider will take care of it as long as you pass in the correct parameters and each proxy provider will have their own page with all the different parameters that they allow you to pass in to them okay so that's everything i wanted to cover in part 9 in part 10 11 and 12 we'll be looking at how you deploy so basically get your spiders to run on a on a server in the cloud so how you deploy the code to your server in the cloud and then how you can schedule and run your spiders to scrape at certain times of the day or the week so you can collect data on a periodic basis without having to have everything running off of your home so we're going to go through some different options there what's available we're going to look at some open sourced options, free options and paid options and just have a look at the different UIs and give you a bunch of different options. And we'll go through the pros and cons of why you should pick one service over another service. And we look at how complex and easy they are to use as well. So that's what we'll be doing in the next three sections. OK, see you in the next part 10, guys. So in part 10, we're going to look at the different tools we can use to deploy and schedule our spiders online and the tools we can use to monitor how well our jobs are doing, how much data is being scraped and if we're missing any pages or items when we are actually running our spiders. So you might be asking yourselves, what is this deployment and scheduling? So deployment is basically us putting the spider that we've just created onto a server that's always going to be online so that we don't have to have our own machine our own laptop or computer running 24 7 at home we can just put that onto a virtual machine somewhere on the cloud and then we can actually schedule it to run at a certain point of time once a week once a day once every hour once every minute however often we want to run our spider to collect the data 
So that's the deployment is the act of getting the spider on the machine and the scheduling is scheduling to run at a certain time of day or time of week. And then the monitoring is just seeing how well our scraping is doing, either seeing how the job's actually completed, did the spider run correctly, did the spider run for the correct amount of time that we thought it was going to run for, did it get all the pages that we thought it should be getting. Obviously, if you see zero pages scraped, you know there's an issue. So that's where the monitoring comes in. And it's very important that we do have some monitoring set up because obviously if you don't, your spider can be running every day and you could be missing huge amounts of data. So that's deployment, scheduling and monitoring. That's the first part we're going to do in this part 10 is we're just going to look at the different tools available. We look at free tools, open source tools and paid tools. So the first is ScrapeD, which is free and open sourced. Anyone can download it and contribute to it as well on GitHub. So the pros of this are it's obviously free and open source. There's plenty of third party libraries for it as well. There's optional UIs from different providers. And the downsides to it are things like you need your own server, ideally, because if you're running it on your own computer or laptop, you would have to have your computer or laptop online at all times if you want to have it, for example, running something every day at a, a set time. So it also doesn't actually have a scheduler. So some of the other tools we look at, such as using ScrapeOps or Scrapey Cloud, there with those tools, you can actually set a scheduled job to run at a specific time every day. But with ScrapeyD, you'd have to use a cron job to hit the API endpoint to get Scrapey to run your job at a specific time. So ScrapeyD is good because it's free and open sourced, but the downside is there's a bit more configuration it's a bit harder to install, but we'll show you exactly how to install it if you want to install it. So the second option, just using ScrapeOps to deploy a schedule and monitor your jobs. The upsides of that are, is it's got a good a UI interface to use, simple to use and understand. It's got built-in monitoring for your jobs and spiders. It's easy to schedule stuff. But the downsides would be you'd need your own server as well, like with ScrapeyD. And the third option with Scrapey Cloud is it's a paid service. They have a freemium kind of version, so you can just check it out if you want with that. It's easy to set up. You can just download their CLI tool, use that to deploy your spider into their Scrapey Cloud service. And then once it's deployed there, you can quickly and easily run it. And you don't need to have your own server set up with another third party provider. So they're the three main options we're going to look at. Scrapey D, ScrapeOps and Scrapey Cloud. So let's first off have a look at Scrapey D. And then we look at two different UI dashboards that we can install so we don't have to control everything using their API endpoints because well that can be useful for some people most people want to interact with their spiders and run them and schedule them using a nice front-end UI okay so scrape ED is available to download as I said we need a third-party server set up first to install scrape ED on so we're going to go ahead and create that with DigitalOcean now. So DigitalOcean is a server provider which enables you to quickly set up virtual machines and then install everything you need on them. So you can also use any other VM provider such as Vulture, for example. These are another good provider and they have very cheap servers as well. So if you go off and create your own account with Vulture or DigitalOcean or AWS, go off, create your virtual machine. I'm going to do that right now with DigitalOcean. And if you want to use this, you can just follow the steps that I'm using. So you just log in, go up to the create, click droplets, select the country or region you want to select. It usually works best when you select a region that you're close to. 
select Ubuntu for the operating system version 22.10. We can select the cheapest virtual machine they have available, which if you just click basic and then go to regular for the SSD type, and then they have a $4 a month server there. So once you've selected the server you want, you can either add an SSH key or a password to log in. That's not that important now, because for this, you can also log in via their console, which can be accessed via the browser. So that's how we're going to do everything now. We're just going to use the browser to log into the machine and install everything we need. Makes it very simple and easy to use. So that's all we need to do. Once we get to the bottom, we just click create droplet and that will go ahead and create the droplet for us. The droplet is just their term for virtual machine. I can see it's creating. So I just give it a minute or two to finish creating and then we can access the console over here. So as you can see, the droplet's being created now. We can click the console button, which will open up a new window for us where we can access the console and type in all the instructions to get everything installed correctly. So as you can see, we're logged in to the virtual machine and now we can start running our commands. So first things first is we want to run sudo apt update that just updates all the packages on the machine to make sure everything we install will be the most up-to-date versions of things. So we'll give that a second to run. That's finished. And the next thing we want is to install Python pip so we can pip install all the packages we need for Python. So that's just sudo apt install python3 dash pip. This command right here. We'll have all these commands easily available for you to copy and paste from our article as well. So you don't have to be pausing the video at every point in time. Okay, so it'll obviously ask, do you want to install this? X amount of space will be used. We're just gonna say yes. And sometimes it'll ask as well to restart certain services, which we can also say yes to. So while that installs, I'm just going to show you the project that we're going to be using. So the project is the part six code. So obviously you may or may not have done that part. If you haven't, you can just git clone our project from here and just type git space clone space this URL. So that this is the project that we're going to be using from part six of this course. Okay, so let's see, Is it's just asking us to restart the services. And now we'll go ahead and git clone our project. So as I said, it's just git clone and then the free code camp dash part dash six. So that's installed. We'll now just CD into our project and we will install a virtual environment using pip install virtual env. So that's after installing virtual env. Now we can actually create our own venv folder where all the Python packages can be installed into. So we'll that, do that with virtual env venv and as you can see, this folder has been created. So now we just need to activate it. So we do that with source vn bin activate. It's activated now. And now we can install the project requirements. So this requirements.txt file contains all, a list of all the things we need to get this project running. So we can just do pip install space dash r space requirements.txt and it'll go ahead and install all the packages that are needed to run the project correctly. So we just give it a minute or two to install everything and then we should be able to run our scrapey spider. Next thing we do, we just CD into our book scraper 
and we'll see if we can run scrapey list. So that ran correctly. And now we can run scrapey crawl book spider. So if we run that, we should see scrapey starting up. And as you can see, all our pages are being scraped. So our pages are being scraped and the data is being extracted from the page, just like we were doing in part six. So that's perfect. We don't have to wait for that to run and complete. The next thing we're going to look at is how we can install ScrapeD. Okay, so we just pip install ScrapeD to install that. And then the next thing we can do is just run ScrapeD. So to do that, it's just ScrapeD. Now I've added on a bit extra after just ScrapeD because I want all the output that usually gets displayed to the screen to go into this ScrapeD logs.txt file. So put all the logs into ScrapeD logs.txt and run this command in the background. So we can go ahead and do that. And now let's check that it's actually up and running. So to do that, we will be using curl to ping the daemon status.json endpoint that lets us know if scrapeyd is running correctly. So when we run that command, it says status is okay. There is zero jobs pending, zero jobs running, zero jobs finished, because obviously We've just ran ScrapeyD, we haven't run any spiders yet. We have ScrapeyD set up. We can hit the endpoint using curl. The next thing we want to do is we want to package up our spider and then deploy it to ScrapeyD. Because if we don't do that, ScrapeyD will not have access to our project and will not be able to run the spider. So to do that, we can install ScrapeyD client. So again, using pip, we just do pip install ScrapeyD client. That will go off and install the ScrapeyD client. The next thing we need to do is we need to go into our scrapey.cfg file. So that should be here, this guy scrapey.cfg so we want to edit that we can use vim our vi and we can all we need to do for this is just uncomment out this line so that it deploys it to scrapeyd which is running on localhost port 6800 so it's handy it's already there all we have to do is go in comment that out. So to save this, we just, I'll show you one second. We just type in the double dots to get up so we can actually save it correctly. And then WQ exclamation, enter, and that saves it. So now that it's saved, we can do a scrapey D deploy and default is the name I've just picked for the project because ScrapeyD works with the concept of projects. So it needs a project name. And then as you can see, it deployed okay. And it now has one spider available. So we can now go ahead and run our spider right now, again, using curl. So curl, it's going to hit this localhost 6800 port and the forward slash schedule.json endpoint. We're adding the project name of default and the spider name of book spider. So because we've deployed it, we should be able to run this and it comes back with a job ID if it has run correctly. So it said status, okay, and we're giving you back a job ID to show that 
the job has been started. Now, this doesn't mean that it finished running. So if there is ever issues, sometimes you need to do further investigation. So we've gone through how to use Scrape ED and Scrape ED Deploy to package up and deploy our spider to Scrape ED and then how we can use curl to schedule our spider using the curl command followed by the schedule endpoint. So obviously if you wanted to just run this yourself, you could just set up a cron and using your cron, you could say schedule this to run every day at whatever time you want. And then you would just be running this command. Obviously, we want to make this easier for people to use. So now we're going to look at the two dashboards that we can install. The first being Scrapey D Web, and the following being the Scrape Ops Scrapey D integration. So for Scrapey D Web, Scrapey D Web is also a third party open sourced application that you can install. And we're going to go ahead now and install that. So I'm just going to go back up to the top level that we were at and just pip install and then the Scrapey D web. So that's going to go ahead and install that. Now it may need a certain specific version of specific packages to be installed. So I've gone ahead and found out that when I was making this video, that four specific packages needs to be installed with a specific version number or the installation wouldn't go and work correctly on the version that of Ubuntu operating system that we're using right now. So it's easy enough. All we're going to do is specify for four different packages, the version that we need. So the first one is just Flask SQL Alchemy. So we're just going to pip install that specific version. The next is we're going to do pip install SQL Alchemy. Then we're just going to install a specific version of Flask. And finally, we're going to pip install a specific version of Workzoic. Once those are all installed, we can now check and see does Scrapey D Web run correctly. So all we need to do is type in Scrapey D Web. Okay, it's giving us an issue, is it? Let's just try and rerun Scrapey D Web again. Yeah, so this time it ran correctly. So I think it just needed to create the settings file initially. So you can, you know, it's running correctly when it stays up and you have the URLs where you can access it showing here. So we can just go ahead and copy the URL that it has given us. So this is the IP address of our server, which you can also get in the DigitalOcean dashboard, followed by 5000, which is the port that Scrapey Web is running on. So if we copy that, go up, paste that into our browser, we should see the Scrapey Web dashboard showing up correctly. So we can see the jobs that have already run. So we can see the job that was run earlier that we ran when we ran it manually via the command line. We had the default project and the spider book spider and the job ID that was returned to us. So it doesn't have the pages and the items because it needs this log parser module to be installed. So we're going to go ahead, install the log parser so we can see the pages and items and more statistics. And we're also going to add in a username and password, just some basic authentication. Right now, anyone can hit this endpoint and start running my jobs. I don't want that to be happening. And I'm pretty sure you guys don't either. So 
you're paying for the server, you don't want anyone to be able to come on and start messing around with your dashboard. So we're gonna quickly go and do that now. So we'll start by just copying and pasting this pip install log parser command. I'm just going to shut down Scrapey web for a second. So run pip install log parser. Then once that's installed, I want to edit my Scrapey D web settings. So I can use VI again. And I'm going to first enable the off. So as you can see here, it's currently set to false. I'm going to set it to true. And then I'm going to set a username of test and a password of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Obviously set better username and passwords than that, please, for your own projects and your own servers. The next thing we need to do is come to our scrapey servers list and just comment out this line here because we don't have a server running on port 6801. We just have our scrapey D running on this port 6800 on localhost. So once that's done, the next thing to do is to add in our logs directory and to enable the log parser here. So let's just enable the log parser by setting that to true, true. And for us, the directory is going to be just root, then the name of the project, free code camp part six, and the name of the spiders, the folder containing the spider, which is book scraper. And then it's got a logs folder in there, which is where the log parser is going to read the logs from. So obviously if you've got a different project name and a different spider name, you need to just make sure that that is correct. But it'll always have a folder in there with logs already. So just find out where your logs folder is and paste in the directory here. And then the last thing we need to do is just set our scrapey D server, which is just the default again, which you can see from above 127.0.0.1 is usually the default and it's running on port 6800. So now that we have all that, I'm just going to save the file. And now that, that is saved, we should be able to run Scrapey D web again. This time I'm going to do like I did with Scrapey D and get the logs to save into a separate log file so they're not coming up on the screen. And I'm going to run it in the background. So that should be running. We can check if everything is running correctly using the following, using the sudo ss command. So we can see that we have scrapey D running on port 6800 of localhost. And we can see that scrapey D web is running on localhost port 5000. So we can see both of them are running. We can see the ports they're running on and we have the process ID which we can use to kill the process. So if we wanted to stop one of them from running, for example, I might as well just stop Scrapey D from running and show you guys. We can just type in kill and then we will get the Scrapey D process ID from here. And we will just paste that in and press enter. And then you guys can see that Scrapey D is no longer running. So that is how you can kill them if they're running in the background as a process like that. So. I'll just start up Scrapey D again. So if we check, we should see Scrapey D running and Scrapey D web running. Perfect. Okay, so because we killed and restarted Scrapey D, we need to just redeploy our project again using the Scrapey D deploy. Because if we go back to our Scrapey D dashboard, we won't be able to see our spider and we won't be able to run our spider. So we need to package up and redeploy the 
project again. So we can just do that with scrapeyd deploy. So it's just scrapeyd dash deploy and we're just picking the project name of default again. So that'll just package up our spider and add it again to scrapeyd. So that's been added again and we can go back to our endpoint. Now it asks us to sign in. So if I try and sign in, it says, no, you need to add in the username and password. So I'll add in my username and password that I set in the config file and sign in. If I go to run spider, we can then see the default, default latest version, book spider, if you need to set any specific settings and arguments for your project, you can do it there. If you want to set it to run at a specific day of the week, hour or minute, you can do it here. So I'm not going to set it for a specific time in the future. I want it to run right now. The next thing I need to do is click just check command. That will paste in a default command which as you can see here, is just going to do the curl to the endpoint that we did earlier. So all Scrapity Web is doing is running this command. So everything is correctly set, the project, the version, the spider, and we just want it to run. So we just click run spider, and that's gonna go off and kick off our, our job, and it's gonna start running. So that should be, running now and we should soon be able to see the statistics coming back for number of pages and items so let's give that a minute or two to run so as you can see it has finished and it took 24 seconds to run and you can see some other stats and pieces like that now we're still missing the pages and items and this sign is still up here saying that we need to install the log parser. So I think I might have actually put in the incorrect path to where the logs are stored. So let's fix that and then we can show you how the pages and items show up. So if we go back, I've discovered that I need to change my path in the Scrapity Web settings. So I can open up my Scrapity Web settings so here you go. So I think we just need to fix this. So as I said, depending on your project, you just need to find where the logs folder is kept. So I think that should do it. It's just forward slash root forward slash free code camp part six and then logs. So I'm just going to save that. And I'm going to restart Scribity web unless it's after fixing itself but i think we need to restart it yep so just go back run the sudo ss dash tunlp command again and we will kill our scribity web using the kill command and we'll run scribity web again so yep so as you can see the log parser ran eight seconds ago and it was last updated at this time. So if we rerun our spider, we're going back to run spider and we put the default project, the latest version, book spider, put in the command run spider and it'll run again. In the meantime, it's gone through and it's parsed the last logs that we ran a couple of minutes ago. And you can see the pages and items have actually been populated here. So it scraped 1,051 pages and there was 1,000 items. And we can see some more stats by clicking the stats button. So you can see what else did it have? Warnings and errors. So there's one warning and you can see the latest item that was scraped and as we can see it was this url this was the book title we can see the pr 
price, tax, and all the other stuff that we've already selected in part five and six. So this is kind of the basics of Scripty Web and how you would install the Scripty Web dashboard to work with Scrapey D. Obviously, you can also see the full logs and, you know, if you need to see exactly a specific error or you need to nail down further into the logs, you've got the full logs available there as well. And it's picked out the warnings and if there was any errors, it would show them as well. So it's very handy. It's free. It's open sourced. You can install it yourself. Um, as you can see, there's a bit of configuring in the settings and there's a little bit more knowledge required into, okay, you need to deploy this project like this. You need to run the spider like that. There is some help pieces as well available. For example, if you forget how to deploy it, they do have a help section here and you can follow the instructions as to, oh, how do I deploy my project so that Scripty Web and Scripty D can use it again. They've got the commands you need to run here and the steps you need to follow. Or you can put in your project um, directory and they can auto package it up using Scripty Web as well. So the next dashboard we look at is the ScrapeOps integration with Scrapey D. So there's two different dashboards for Scrapey D. Scrapity Web and the ScrapeOps dashboard. So for that, you need to go off and create a ScrapeOps account. So you can just go to scrapeops.io. And if you've been using it for any of the other parts we've gone through already in our course, you can use the existing API key you have. If you're just joining us for this section, you can sign up, register for free and get your own API key. So you will just need the API key and then you will just need to follow the monitoring steps. So we'll just click monitoring. It should be Scrapey. So I need to do pip install scrape up Scrapey. And we'll do pip install scrape ops dash Scrapey. So we've installed the scrape ops SDK. We just need to add our API key to the Scrapey project settings. So I can copy this line, go now into my folder and I want to edit my settings.py file. And I'm going to just add the API key in here and check what else I need to install. I also need to install the extension and the downloader middlewares. So go down to my downloader middlewares and I'll add those in here. So copy that paste that in and to the extensions I'll just put that under the existing extensions there so paste that in as well so I've got the download remit the download remit words the extension and the API key so I should be able to now save that and just check that there's nothing else to do there. I think that's all correct. So that's to install the monitoring. So everything will show up in the dashboard, but we now want to install the actual scheduling side of things. So for that, we will go to the servers and deployment section and we will add a new Scrapey D server. So we just need the name of our server. We'll just do test. 
obviously you can name your server whatever you want we need the server ip address so we will go to our DigitalOcean dashboard and copy the ip address here so the ip v4 so copy that and just need to paste that in and save the details and then it's saying you should SSH into your server. We're already in on our console and it says run the command in your terminal. So we will copy this command and go back to our console. And I'll just go back up to the top and paste that in. It's installing everything it needs it might need to restart some services again we can say yes to that once it's finished we will say yes to that and okay so everything seems to be finished so we can now go back and check our servers list and we can see our server name is there and it's connected and we can check our server perfect so if we need to edit or delete the details there and it says your server is now set up correctly you can schedule your jobs on the scheduler page here i'll click that and click schedule job and i have my server name i've got my spider book spider i will run the spider now and I can click if I wanted to run it every month, every day. All I can select, you know, a specific month or whatever. We'll do that in a second. For now, I just want to run it now. And I don't have any settings and arguments to add in. So I can submit the job and the job is scheduled. So in a few seconds, that should show up in the jobs list. In the meantime, let's go and schedule a job to run, let's say, once a week. So let's say every Monday at 7 a.m. Um, obviously, that's in UTC time zone. Crons are usually run in UTC. So you need to make sure that that corresponds to your own time zone correctly. So we're saying every Monday at 7 a.m., please run the book spider spider on the test server. And if we submit that, it should then show up in our list. So there you go. At 7 a.m., only on Mondays, it'll run. That's very useful if you need to set up your spider to run every day or every hour or whatever you can view and edit them here and you can enable them disable them so if we go back to our dashboard we don't have any details coming through yet there might have been an issue with running it as well but we'll explore that now so when there's an issue like this where we can't see any data coming into a dashboard the best thing to do is to try and just run the scrapey list or the scrapey crawl command manually from our server so i'm just going to go back to the console and go back into the project and from inside the free code camp part 6 book scraper folder i'm going to run a scrapey list first and if there's an issue with scrapey or there is an issue with the settings it'll show up here. So scrapey list and we have an error, a scrapey error and scrapey is saying that there is an indentation error in the downloader middlewares. So that's probably what's causing the issue. So we can just uh, edit that. So open up our settings again and check it said download middlewares, so I think it's just that there is a space 
here. And in case it's also this guy, I'll just remove the indentations there and do the same for the extensions. And then hopefully there's no more issues. So save that and try running Scrapey List again. And this time it worked and Book Spider is returned. Perfect. So if we go back to our ScrapeOps dashboard and try and run that again. So it's got the server and spider we need selected and we can submit job. So this time within hopefully a couple of seconds, let's just go back to our servers page and go back to our jobs page. We can see it's now running. So it's after kicking off at 623. We'll give that a couple of seconds to run and then we should also have the stats available for this job. So we can see on Monday, one job run and it's in the middle of running now. So we'll give it a couple of seconds to run and then we should see things like the runtime, the pages, missed pages, items, and all the other stats coming through. Okay, so on our jobs page now, we can see that the status has changed to finished. It took 25 seconds and we can see the number of pages, items, coverage, and everything there. So we can actually click into that now and we can see all the pages scraped there, the runtime and everything in more detail. So we also have things like number of items, the fields that were scraped. So this pulls in stuff like the, we can see if there was any stuff that was missed. So things like the number of stars, the price, everything, most things seem to be at 100%. And um, obviously the description there, there was one or two descriptions that were missed for some reason. So this is can be useful to see which fields were missed or which fields came through correctly. You can also see the amount of bandwidth that was used and we can see that there was one warning as well. So obviously when you have multiple runs of the same spider, then you can actually compare. If you're running this daily, you could compare the stats every day and then if on one day suddenly you see a major divergence in the stats you can say okay there must be an issue with my spider i need to investigate and go in and investigate further so that's very useful we also have the status codes if there's 500s coming back our 404s the page isn't found so maybe they the links are broken so you can use these status codes as well to diagnose any other issues. So that's how you would use the ScrapeOps dashboard to integrate in with ScrapeD, which would also be running on your server. So you've two different dashboards that you can use with ScrapeD, ScrapeD Web or the ScrapeOps dashboard and integration. If you guys have any other questions with that, you can stick it in the comments as well. So in the next section we'll be looking at how we can instead of using scrapey d to integrate with scrape ops we'll be looking at using the complete scrape ops integration to integrate in directly with your scrapey project instead of using scrapey d as a kind of a middle layer which gets integrated with your project and then other things have to integrate in and hit the API endpoints. This just goes directly and integrates with your server and your project. So that's what we'll be looking at in part 11. And then part 12, we'll be looking at using the Scrapey cloud. So that's it for now and see you in part 11. So in part 11 of the Scrapey beginners course, we're going to be looking at using ScrapeOps to manage, deploy, and monitor our spiders. So we'll jump straight into it. First things first, we're going to 
need to set up a virtual machine. So you can do it with AWS if you already have an account with them. You can do it with DigitalOcean. Most of these different companies have free credits, so you can just sign up, use their free credits, try it out, and then go from there. So I've already got a DigitalOcean account, and I'm going to be using that so you guys can follow along with that. Or you guys, if you already have an AWS or Azure account, you can follow on from the step where we log in to the actual virtual machine. So I'm just going to quickly set up a server here. I'm going to go on to the cheapest ones they have, which are $4 a month. And I think that's all I need to select. So I can just create Droplet. Now that the Droplet's been created, I have the dashboard available where it shows things like the IP address and a few different graphs. I'm just going to open the console now. So that's going to open up a new window and it's going to SSH onto our machine and then we can then run commands on our virtual machine. So while that's getting set up, if you guys haven't already set up a account with ScrapeOps so you can get a free account there and we'll be using them now to integrate with our server. So go ahead, create an account. I have one already set up. Once your account is set up, go to servers and deployments on the side where it says add servers, click add, and then we're going to name our server free code camp. And we're going to put in the IP address of the server. So we get that from here, copy that IP address, paste it in, save the details, and now it says to provision a server, we need to run this script on our server. So we copy the details there, go in to our terminal, our console for the server, and paste in the script details. So that's going to go off, run the script and provision the server, and we can see that it is running through installing the dependencies it needs, installing a new user and the authorized keys and installing the required libraries. So that's just going to run through those different steps. And once it's complete, we should be able to then go on and clone our spider onto our server using the dashboard. So that can take a minute or two. We let it just run through the different steps. So now our provisioning has completed and it's brought us into the server dashboard. And here we have options like clone repository, add spider, delete the server, edit the details, schedule jobs, and the SSH keys for the server. So we're gonna go ahead and go to the clone repository. That's where it's going to be getting the details of the repository that we paste in, and then it's gonna clone the spider directly onto our server so we don't need to actually do it manually ourselves we can do it through this ui here so for that we're going to first go to the free code camp part six that we've been using in the part 10 video so we're going to use part six and the next thing you want to do is you want to fork your own copy obviously if you have your own spider and you're using that, that's fine. If you're following along with me now, the best thing to do is fork your own copy. So click the fork button, follow the steps. That's just going to copy over the free code camp part six onto your own repo. And then from there, like I have here, I've just done it myself. I now have it under my own name. And in here, the next step will be to add the deploy key. So this deploy key will enable us to do commands like git clone and pull the repo directly from our GitHub onto the machine. So we just need to add that key. We go to settings, deploy keys, add deploy key. I'm going to call it free code camp VM. And I'm going to paste in my deploy key. So you get this deploy key in here. 
you copy that, you add it in here, remove any spaces, and we don't need to allow right access for the moment because we're just going to be pulling and we can add the key. So once the key is added, we can then go back to our main UI here. The next thing we need to do is just go and grab our URL from the main page here, grab our URL. So this is my repository and this is my own copy of the free code camp part six. The branch name is main. So you can see it here, it's main. So I need to make sure to put in the right branch name. And then the language is Python and the framework is Scrapey. So that's all correct. So this is the install script that's going to run. When we click on repo, it's going to go in to our virtual machine. It's going to then git clone it. And then once it's git cloned the repo, it's going to go into the repo, install a Python virtual environment, activate the virtual environment, and then install the modules that are in the requirements.txt. So if you look in here, it's going to install the different modules that are listed in here, which is everything that the project needs to run. So once it's done that, it's just going to make sure that Scrapey is installed. And while we're at it, we're going to add the monitoring module for scrape ops as well. So let's just add in that here as well. So install scrape ops scrapey, which installs the monitoring Python module for us. So once that's all in here, we can click clone repo and it's going to go through the steps here. So it's cloning the repo. Great. And then it's going to run the install script, which can take two or three minutes. And then the next step is it's going to find the scrapey spiders by running the scrapey list command. So I'm just going to give it a minute or two, and then we will hopefully see our repo in our table here. And we'll see the spider, our book spider in under the spiders table on the right. So as you can see, the install script ran correctly and it was able to find our spiders as well. So you can see our spider automatically came in here and here is our cloned repository. So if you click in, you can see that there is a deploy script here as well. So if you need to deploy updates to your code, you will update your own repository. And then for the code to actually go onto the server, you just need to click, go in here and click deploy and it will then pull the latest from your repository. So that's how you would update the code on your VM. Okay, so we have a repository, we have our spider. So let's just go ahead and show you guys, you can quickly run the spider by just clicking the run now button. It'll go in, select the server, the repository and the spider because you could have multiple spiders in your repository. And we're just gonna click submit job to run it straight away. So the job has started. And if you want to check the logs straight away, you just come here and click view logs. So you can see it's just gone ahead and it's running the spider correctly. And you can see the title, product type, price, everything is coming through. So that's how simple it is to run the spider. So the last step we want to do now is to activate the monitoring for our spider. So instead of having to just look at a bunch of logs in a log file like that, we can have everything displaying in the dashboard like we had in part 10. So to do that, let's just open up the docs, go to monitoring, Python Scrapey, Scrapey SDK integration. So we've already done this pip install scrape up scrapey as part of the install script when we cloned our repository. So we don't need to do that again, but we do need to add in our API key and the extension bits here. So it's telling us we need to add this to our settings.py file in our scrapey project. 
So let's go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna open up my repository, go to book scraper, and go to the settings.py file, and I can just edit it directly in here. So I'll need to add the three different sections. So first I'll add the API key, and then I'll go and add the extension and the downloader middlewares. So I'll just copy this line and go to GitHub, paste this in. Here, I need to get my API key, which I can get from my settings here. Paste in my API key. And then I want to go to my extensions and then the downloader middlewares. So the extensions are currently commented out, so I'll just add it underneath. And last of all, the downloader middlewares. So obviously, if you guys are using your own spider that has the downloader middlewares uncommented out, and you're just adding these two lines to your existing list. But here, because it's currently commented out, I'm just pasting in the whole lot in together. So we've got the extensions, the downloader middlewares, and the API key. So we should be able to just commit the changes. And now we can deploy the code via our dashboard. So now that that's completed, we go back to our server, go into our free code camp server, go into our clone repository, and click deploy here. So the latest has been deployed. We can check the log as well to see did the deployment work. So we can see it updated the book scraper settings.py file. One file changed with nine insertions. So that's perfect. Great. So now that that's in, we should be able to run our book spider again, submit the job, and if we check the logs again, we can see it's kicked off. And if we go to our jobs list, we can see there's one running. So this is the one we ran for part 10. And this is the one that is running now. So once it's completed running in about 20 more seconds, we should see the pages, items, coverage, and everything else fill in as well. And we can also see that in our dashboard. We can see under Tuesday, we have this job that is running now. So we'll just quickly show you how you can also schedule it. So in case you're just joining us for part 11. If you want to schedule a job to run on this server recurring, you just go and click recurring. And then you can select we want okay, every day in March, we want every every time at midnight, we want this job to run. So we'll submit the job. And then we can check in our schedule jobs, we have book spider, which will run at 12 every day only in March. And there it is. So then if you need to edit that, or you want to just disable it, you can go to the scheduler tab. And you have the ability just to disable it there, or delete it, clone it, view the logs, whatever you need to do. So if we just go back to our dashboard, we can now see that the job is completed. The page is scraped are there. We can see the items are there and everything looks like it ran correctly. So we can compare the, the two days. So yesterday, this many pages were scraped or this many status codes came back today. This many status codes came back. So it is useful if you need to compare the same job that was run over multiple days. You can quickly see 
okay, if the runtime varied or if the number of page varied, varies or the items or the coverage, you can see that very quickly in one page, one glance. So that makes it very useful. And if we need to drill down into the individual job, we can just click in and we can delete the job data or do anything else we need to do here. So that brings us to the end of this section. Any questions you guys might have, let us know. And I hope you have an idea now of how to quickly get set up with a virtual machine and hook it up to use ScrapeOps. So a reminder that everything that we've used with ScrapeOps here is free to use. So there's no limitations on the amount of servers you can hook up or the amount of jobs you can run. So that's the end of part 11, guys. So in part 12, we're going to look at everything to do with Scrapey Cloud. So Scrapey Cloud was made by the developers of Scrapey, and it's a way which you can deploy and run and schedule your spiders on the cloud. Using Scrapey Cloud, the great thing is you don't need to have your own third party server. So you don't need to have a server with DigitalOcean or Vulture or AWS. You can just deploy it directly onto Scrapey Cloud and just run it. The only downside is that if you want to schedule your jobs, it's paid. So you can run your jobs and it's free, but to schedule your jobs on Scrapey Cloud, you have to sign up for a monthly subscription. So we'll show you how everything works. And then between Scrapey Cloud, ScrapeOps, and ScrapeyD, you guys will have had a full overview of all the different ways you can deploy, schedule and run your spiders on the cloud. And you can decide then which kind of way you want to go. Do you want to go with a completely open source way with using just ScrapeyD and ScrapeyD web? Or do you want to go with a free way using ScrapeOps? Or do you want to go with a paid solution with Scrapey Cloud. So you'll have the full op array of options covered by the time we finish part 12. Okay, so let's quickly look at Scrapey Cloud. So Scrapey Cloud is obviously made by Zeit, the creators of Scrapey, scalable cloud hosting for your Scrapey spiders. And that's pretty much what it is. Host and monitor your Scrapey spiders in the cloud, as we said, and it's very reliable easy to scale, as they say, on-demand scaling. They have lots of other integrations as well. So what we need to do is you need to go ahead and create an account with them. Once you have an account, you can then go into the dashboard and access Scrapey Cloud here on the side. So I'm just going to start a new project and I'm going to call it just Free Code Camp. and click start so then it's got the instructions here of what we need to do to install the command line tool so we can easily deploy our spider into the scrapey cloud so first things first we're going to go ahead and we're going to be using the part six code example again so the code that we used for part six of this course we're going to just git clone that so i've got an empty folder here open in vs code and i'm just going to git clone the free code camp part six and then i'm going to quickly install a virtual environment obviously if you guys are on windows or on linux you guys need to follow the steps that we covered in part two of this course to make sure you're installing the correct virtual environment for your operating system. And then once the virtual environment is set up, we can activate it. So just do source vnv bin activate. And now it's activated and now we can go and follow the instructions here. So I'm just going to copy and paste them in directly. So install shub and then do the shub login. 
and then it's just a matter of putting in my API key. Okay, so that's all installed. Put in shub login. That says I'm already logged in. I'll just log out to make sure that you guys can see the full process. So shub login. Put in my API key from here. Paste in my API key. Obviously, you guys will be putting in your API key. So please don't use mine. And then we can just do shub deploy and it should deploy uh, if I'm in my correct project. So I'm inside my project and I think it wants there to be a scrapey.cfg file. So you need to make sure you're in the correct folder. And if it's correct, it you can see the deploying to scrapey cloud project and then the project ID there. So in the meantime, you can see it builds the project and then it uploads it to the site here. So here you can see it's been deployed and it's successful. So if it works correctly, this should all be very similar to what you see. So now that it's deployed into the cloud, we can go to our jobs dashboard and we should be able to run our spider. So we have our book spider available now in the dropdown and we can leave everything else the same. You've got priorities there if you want to have certain jobs running ahead of others. So we can just click run and that should kick off the book spider and it should start scraping our books to scrape site. So you can see it's running away there and we should see then when it's completed, it'll be in the completed table. And it'll also have the items and the requests and the errors all available here as well. So they'll start populating in a second. So as you can see, three requests, the logs are there. If we wanted to run every day, once a week, periodically, whenever we want, we just go to periodic jobs, click add periodic job, select the spider, and then we can select, okay, we want to run every Monday at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. And we can just select every day or every Monday, 7 a.m and we can save that. So as you can see here, it says the periodic jobs below will not run because I have not created a paid subscription. So you just need to click subscribe now and then sign up for the paid version and then this job will run every Monday at seven. But if you guys just wanna try it out, then you can just schedule the jobs normally by clicking run here manually yourselves. So my spider is still running away. We'll just leave that complete and then we'll have a look at the items and requests and some of the stats that are available. So as you can see, our job is completed. We've the thousand items, the requests, so the amount of pages that were scraped and the logs. So we can click into the requests and you can see the thousand requests if you want. So you can see all the specific URLs that were scraped, the statuses, etc., etc. The items then are a bit more interesting, obviously, because that's the actual data that we scraped. So we've got everything set up nicely there. Our prices, taxes, titles, URLs, description, etc., etc. So you can check quickly if the information that was scraped correctly came through or not. And if you need to look at the logs or the stats, that's also available there. So as you can see, it's very polished, very nice, simple to use, and also works and auto scales when you need to scale things as well. 
So I think that's the ins and outs of Scrapey Cloud. I think now you should have a very good idea of the different options you have when it comes to deploying your spiders and then scheduling and running your spiders and seeing all the stats in various dashboards. So just to go through the three options you have, first option, Scrapey D, which can run just via an API endpoint and you can hit the API endpoint to schedule things and deploy things. With Scrapey D, you have two UIs you can use with it. The Scrapey D web are the Scrape Ops dashboards, which we've shown you how to install. So that's the free open source part. The second option was using Scrape Ops for everything and using the Scrape Ops integration directly with a server such as DigitalOcean or AWS or Vulture. So you need to set up a VM quickly there first. And then the final option was just using Scrapey Cloud for everything and deploying it directly to Scrapey Cloud. But it was paid if you want to do any sort of periodic jobs to schedule them to run daily or weekly or whatever. So there are the three main options and I'll leave it up to you guys to decide what works best for you. So that brings us to the end of part 12 and in part 13 we'll just go through everything and do a quick recap of the entire course. So see you in part 13 guys. So guys we've come to the end of our Scrapey Beginners course. This is the last part so we'll just do a quick wrap up and then I'll give you a small bit of an overview of some extra skills you might find useful if you want to continue on and get better at scraping using Scrapey. So we've built an end-to-end -end Scrapey project that scrapes all the books from books to scrape and then cleans the data and stores the extracted data in different file formats and different places such as a database. We then looked at optimizing our headers and user agents so that websites would let us get through any anti-bot software that they have on their site. And we also looked at how we can use proxies and the different proxy provider options that are out there if we want to have something that's a little less hands-on. And then finally we looked at how you can deploy your spider to the cloud onto a server and then how you can schedule it to run periodically and then how you can view the results of your running spiders. But obviously that isn't everything. We've only gone through the kind of basics. There's still a lot more different edge cases that we haven't covered and the number one thing is probably scraping dynamic websites. So there's a lot of websites out there that are rendered in the browser so that means that they're using a front-end framework which um, will actually only display the page once all the data is received by the browser. So in that case, if you were to ask for a URL, what you get back might not contain the data you're looking for because it hasn't had a chance to render inside in a browser. So things I would recommend that you look at in, in those cases would be looking at things like Scrapey Puppeteer or Scrapey Selenium, which then use Scrapey with a headless browser integration to actually render the website in a headless browser. So then that way, using Scrapey Puppeteer or Scrapey Selenium, you can actually render the page and get the data you need. The other option would be to find the API endpoint, because most of these sites that are front-end rendered have API endpoints and you can find the data there. So I'll just give you one example of what it would look like to see the data coming back from an API endpoint. So I would recommend if you guys want to work through a couple of different challenges, site have put together this great site, which we've been using for our books to scrape.com, but they also have a bunch of different other examples using this quotes to scrape.com, where you can, for example, have infinite scrolling, so how would you get around a page where you have infinite scrolling, like something like Instagram or Facebook? Um, you can practice having a JavaScript rendered site. So there's all these kind of 
different options which you can practice with and they have all these different pages available here for you to practice on so one example would be this one see we're scrolling down and if you go to your network tab you can see there is data being asked for every time we scroll down so more pages of data are being requested and they come back but instead of it being html it comes back as json and in this json data we've got the quotes which then the front end framework then goes off and populates the page with so this is an example of where you can actually directly query an api endpoint instead of actually scraping the html you can ask for the api endpoint to give you back the data directly so that even makes your life easier so this is one example of what i was talking about if you come into contact with a front-end rendered page that gets rendered in the browser so i really would recommend you guys checking out and working your way through these different challenges that are available on the toscrape.com site now another very important thing is obviously getting through a login endpoint which we didn't do in this course but which is something which a lot of websites would have so that is something as well i would really recommend that you guys go off and explore how to do so the last major thing i think would be looking at how you can scrape at scale if you really want to imagine you're scraping millions of pages a day you know there's different ways which you can use things like scrapey redis to use redis to store all the urls you want to scrape in one central place and then you could have multiple different servers pulling urls off this queue and then the all the urls can be scraped by multiple different worker machines at the same time again this is all using scraping so that is something i would highly recommend you guys to look at as well if you're interested in scraping at scale now all this stuff we also have as articles and videos so if you guys want to check out some more videos and in-depth articles i would recommend you guys checking that out like we have scraping behind logins and we have separate articles on using scrapey puppeteer scrapey selenium etc and also using scrapey redis if you want to do a distributed worker architecture so all that is up there for you guys if you want to continue on your journey and learn more about scrapey and the kind of more challenging parts of using scrapey to scrape the web so i think that comes to the end of our course i'd like to thank you for following along and if you have any questions just reach out put a comment on the video and we'll do our best to get back to you thanks guys